Can I get a water? Please, thank you. Cold, it's fine, whatever is easiest. Oh no. Happy Sunday, everybody. Hold on, let me try to fix my camera camera here. That is not working. All right, we're going to put on a video real quick while I figure this out. We'll be right back. Hello everyone, thanks for joining the tour today and we're going to be taking a look at the newly renovated bungalows or otherwise now known as the cottages which we've gone through about half of them so far and we're looking at cottages number four and eight at this time and this is just a view of the balcony we changed the entrance from being in the middle and so if you are familiar with the property there used to be an entrance for two rooms and one of these bungalow housing structures and now each bungalow each room has their own entrance to the side and a little bit more privacy as well because we split the balcony so you don't necessarily have to talk to the neighbor if you don't want to but you can of course go around if you would like and moving into the room itself these are brand new beds and frames and new design with the throw pillows and the standard pillows in the back there and then you can also see the kitchenette unit that we renovated and we'll get to in a second also we added a working desk with the ch a charging station so you have usb and also type c there as well right below the television and that's for anybody who wants to get some work done especially those work from home people and this is a wider view of the room and i just want to make note of the ac because these used to be fan cooled rooms and now we inputted uh, got rid of the the louver windows and so now it's completely sealed up if you will with as far as the windows go brand new windows and also want to bring attention to the ceilings. So the ceilings used to be flat and now we brought them up to an apex to give a little bit more room and make it feel a little bit more spacious, but still maintain the coziness and also bringing some more attention to the far right corner of the kitchenette that we, we have. And we'll get to that in a second and also the newly renovated bathroom. So we basically gutted this entire place. Even, even the floor tiles are, are brand new as well. And this is another angle of the bed and just want to bring some attention to the LED bed frame as well as the embedded nightstands and, and lamps and another view of the kitchen, kitchenette I should say. And as you can see, it has basically all the utensils and tools that you might need to cook a meal. Included is a mini fridge there down on the left and a hot plate, coffee maker, ice bucket, all the knives and utensils that you may need to feed a small family not necessarily thanksgiving dinner but you can definitely chef it up in there especially if you're staying for an extended period of time this might be a perfect type of accommodation for you and that essentially is the kitchen and now moving on to the bathroom and as i mentioned before like floor to ceiling new new floor tiles new ceiling tiles um we got the led frame all right, sorry to cut that off, but 
needed to buy myself a little bit of time. Hope you all are doing well. Happy Sunday to you all. I think most people are coming in from the premiere, uh, the one that I did with Israel, uh, if you haven't seen it, which is I thought was pretty good, which is really the basis of our discussion today. And I thought the timing of it was perfect. But of course, please let me know where you're chiming in from, what city, what state, what country. Always love to hear where everybody is from. And today we are going to hang out as per usual. Do usually do do our usual Sunday hangout and catch up with one another and have what I think will be pretty interesting discussion. And always love hearing from you all. And uh, just like hanging out on a Sunday. So I think a lot, like I said before, I think a lot of people are just kind of uh, rolling in from the premiere of the interview that I did with Israel. We haven't uploaded in a long time, as I'm sure a lot of people are aware of because of the preparation for Throp X. So I'm excited to kind of get back to our upload schedule really for the rest of the year. Uh, as I've been alluding to in previous weeks, we have a lot of interviews and a lot of content that excuse me is just sitting on the shelf so we are going to be releasing them slowly uh so before we get into the discussion uh let me hop over to the comments here and say hello to some of you all uh 876j what's going on man good to see you says the pull would be tenfold if the government uh fix uh, crime and healthcare. I'm going to save that comment because that comes up quite a bit and we'll touch on that a little bit later. Hello, Donna chiming in from Ottawa it says happy Sunday Throp and Throppers. Good to have you. Nurse T. Marie, nice to see you. Thanks for joining. Anne Marie Walker, blessed Sunday Throp and Throppers. Natural Yard says Wagwan, good to see you. Norman FL, uh, maybe Florida. Uh, hi, Throp and Throppers. Hi, Dale. Afternoon to you, Chris. What's going on? Always representing Strong Island. Afternoon, Corey MPA chiming in from South Florida. Rachel, what's going on? Good to see you. Hello to Rachel's mom. Shana Love Coaching says, happy Sunday, beautiful people. Cherie, happy Sunday to you as well. Uh, there's T. Marie talking about the split balcony and the cottages, which are showing shortly. Earlier, earlier, what's going on, Chelsea? Andrew, good to see you. Shana says the new cottages are well designed, cozy, quaint, stylish, and an elegant vibe. Thank you very much, Shana. Lisa Marie, good afternoon, Throp and Throppers. Chiming in from Cloudy, Connecticut. Natasha Parker, good lovely sunday everyone from sunny california and jamaica wonderful crystal nicole happy snowy sunny from iowa oh snow already camille says hey guys in cold new york oh no charles pet grave what's going on charles good to see you charles says hello throp and throppers throp x 2023 was great so much more info networking and fun glad i was there big up to all the new friends i've made on this throp x episode awesome awesome charges a repeat uh, offender or should i say a tender he came to the inaugural drop x last year and he came this year which is great and it was just so awesome to see people come two years in a row i don't even know how that makes me feel that's so that's so cool that's so cool and uh like those people i look at as well as like a they were good good resource to have there that people could kind of trust outside of the official speakers and volunteers and that sort of thing. So I appreciate you, Charles. I appreciate the support. It's so nice to have you again for a uh, second year in a row. Nurse T. Marie is timing in from California. Hi, Suzette. Hello again. Suzette was in the premiere. A bunch of you were in the premiere earlier. Chelsea Clinton says this is a five-star cabin. Thank you. Talking about the cabins at Travelers. Kemi, Hello, everyone from San Antonio, Texas. Nice to see you. Nice to have you. Marie D says, blessings, throp and throppers. Betsy Mason says, so nice. Hello from Minnesota, where it snows. 
uh soon come to jamaica awesome sorry about the snow sherry case sherry case hello from florida what's going on joe uh just as hey throp hope you had a good thanksgiving yes i did i did had to, uh, had friends giving yesterday with my friends here in new york denise robin says happy sunday happy to be here alberta canada nice to see you ad sarah says happy spiritual sunday from canada wonderful interview i think israel nailed it being black in canada is not a picnic and that is something that i really did not know and i learned a lot about during our sit down and interview that we had so it was uh, quite the education for me mark castle says hey throp and throppers happy sunday from cold cold brampton ontario sorry to hear about all this cold simone b says hello throp and everyone hello simone k natural good day to you as well kingston 16 says happy sunday from california 80s hair says i will try to be at thropx next year to explore the possibility of making a big move i actually want to run an idea by you all before we get into the the stream as you say that 80s hair um and we'll we'll get to that before we get into the today's subject uh, aqua patel says hello from sunny florida nipping away on uh ripped ripened sour sap good for you from your backyard that's awesome and please listen to shana she says remember to hit the like button on your way in please do monica tarant says hello all here from florida uh so the idea this is from like this triggered triggered me talking about this i want to talk about this anyway so just kind of coming off of Throp X, and this this ha this this happened last year, and I thought people were joking like, "Hey, are you gonna do another one like in April?" And I was like, "No way," because of the amount of just man hours that have gone that had gone into planning it and the coordination, and the amount of just bringing people together. You can imagine it took a lot of work and effort uh, to certainly to pull it off at the level that we did. And we continue just to try to, to, to go bigger, better, stronger, and just continue just to bring as much value as humanly possible to everybody in attendance, whether in person or virtually. And so the idea of doing another one so soon, I was like, oh, there's no way. So, and then the same thing happened this year as people uh, who were there wanted more uh, the speakers wanted more they were asking when is this they can have an opportunity to do this again and i was just like you know not till next year but talking with the team after we just kind of like brainstorming like hey could we do something like this like an online version of this sooner and i was like yeah that is much easier to plan and the speakers are very interested in in coming as well and participating i just I only talked to like a handful but anyway the idea is and i wanted to see what everybody th thinks about doing something like this uh that we do we do a version so there's two versions of this that we're thinking about so there's a version where it's we have thropex it, it's like maybe it's not called thropex but it's basically the same thing we'll have speakers come in uh, with the, uh, and we'll have and i'll go and find people specifically for topics that you all are interested in the throp community is interested in and we'll do a virtual version of that and we will i would say take the same approach handpick persons that we have personal relationships with that we trust and then we'll also go after professionals in subject matters and areas that you are interested in that you want that perhaps um, you are having challenges finding or maybe finding a trusted person in that field and like let's think let's think extremely broadly and i know we're focused here on jamaica and people are interested in like how do i move here how do i invest here we're just coming off the interview with israel and I thought I and think he is such a, just a, a gem and a wealth of knowledge and information. And I think the more he goes along his journey of moving to Jamaica, the more valuable and more information experience and knowledge that he's going to have and be able to pass on. So there's there's that element. Then there's like the, the element of professional. So 
uh, this year we didn't have a real estate lawyer, but we had a lot of recommendations for lawyers that the real estate agents work with and that they could recommend. And all the agents that I work with, I, I highly recommend, and they are part of the trusted circle, so to speak. And so anyway, that's the one idea. So uh, maybe doing a, a Thropex in April that is purely online. And that would be something that would be kind of easy to, not easy, but a lot easier than planning a full-fledged week-long investment conference in person and online. And so that's the one idea. The second idea is that we're considering doing is doing a version of that it wouldn't be conference style. It would be more like uh, like a private group, right? And this would be like a private group that we would start that we would say do like a Skype session or something like that. And maybe there would be one or two topics that we would tackle that is very niche, very particular. Um, maybe we'd have one to two speakers, three max that we would have come on. And we would invite everybody to come on to this, uh, basically a webinar, I, I would say. But it's a, it's, it's, it wouldn't, it's very different from our live stream. It would be for like, uh, maybe trying to think of like a specific topic that may be interested, maybe like a small group of people who are interested in say, how do I buy, how do I ship a car into Jamaica? You know, it's think, think super niche, super narrow, where like it wouldn't necessarily appeal to the broader audience, but there's a small group of people that I just want to really appeal to and just like hit and help them. But instead of helping people one on one, I'm helping like 10 people or 20 people because like the, this idea came off of ThropX, but it was derived from I get a lot of emails and uh, into messages and Candice and the team does as well of kind of the same question that people, same questions. A lot of the people have the same questions, variations that are specific to their situation. Uh, but it's, it's. I hate to say this like this, but it, in a sense, it's just not worth my time, our time to like go so deep into that one person situation and to help them and to guide them because it's just too much. We're such a small team. It's too much to like just do this essentially consulting, free consulting to help these people. And we want to help as many people as possible. And so I'm like, instead of doing that, and I know there are, you know, 10 more, 100 more people that have that same question. How about let's do it in a group setting and we're able, and then on top of that, we can, if we decide, I guess we can post it. And so other people can get more value from it. So instead of just helping that one person who has that question, we can help a hundred people who have that same question and then they can get like super value out of that. So those are like the two ideas that we have, uh, that we have uh, post drop X and we're kind of seeing if that makes if that's something that you'd be interested in and that you'd support i don't even know if we we charge for it we might like i didn't like when i first came up with it like i told candies i was like yo let's do it for free and she's like no no we have to charge something just to like kind of have people put um just some skin in the game and i get that so maybe there'll be a version that's free maybe and then we'll do something like something nominal you know like ten dollars or twenty dollars or something like that just to just like you just have put something in just to show that you're serious about whatever the topic is. And then it is it just like a slight vetting process, you know, maybe it'll be five bucks. I don't know, but something, uh, and I think Candy's had a good, I like just like good ment mentality about that. It's just to get people who are serious about that subject and who are willing to invest even like a nominal amount of money. So, uh, yeah, let me know what you think of those two ideas. These are the kind of the things that we're rummaging around in our heads, probably doing uh, maybe later towards the spring, summer of uh, next year, because these these things do take a little bit of time to uh, to plan. And of course, we want to do it professionally and we want to get the right people and we just don't want to rush to do it. So we're just kind of thinking of thinking of doing this, uh, something like that. And this is kind of how ThropX got started. We were just having a discussion just like this and we we're just throwing spitballing ideas and Next thing you know, we're doing annual investment conferences. Uh, so, yeah, let's see what some of the comments let's say. Charles Adderley says, uh, chiming in from NASA Bahamas and outstanding stream broadcast as usual. I love Jamaica. Awesome. Um, 
Douglas Joseph says, many reasons people want to move to Jamaica, weather, culture, foods, uh, love of people, music, uh, beautiful water. Uh, the list goes on. We're going to hop into all of that. Eric, what's going on? Says, I, hello, Throb. We'll be back in the grill next month to check you out again. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Uh, Virtual Design Studio says, I love it. Love the direction. Talking about the idea. Thanks, Fabrika. Nurse T. Marie says, uh, sounds like a great idea for a virtual summit. Thank you. Kata says, happy Sunday, y'all from Maryland. We are currently experiencing cold. Sorry to hear that. Marie D says, they both sound like good ideas, can do them interchangeable. Thank you for that. Natasha Parker says, will you have a survey for us to, to pick uh, the topic, I guess? Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can do that. That's a very, very good idea. And I do like it, it, like whichever one we go with, I do want to get it to a point like, hey, maybe we do something like this once a quarter, but we want to get the first one right. And then if we can do it once a quarter, that would be great. Um, and I think, again, we can just really serve and facilitate all these things that we're talking about. And we'll get into like why I feel like this is important shortly. Uh, Jason McPhail. Uh, I'm moving to Jamaica. Canada has become 100% poison zombie wasteland. What happens when Big Pharma is allowed to poison every household with opioids? The uh, U.S. is having like kind of the same problem. I know that's, I was going to say mostly in the, like like West Coast, but I know like a lot of West Coast cities have like a really hard time with that. But he like in the East Coast, same thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty bad, pretty, pretty horrible. Sorry to hear that. Simone B says, yeah, you should charge something. A lot of people do online summits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's that's what I'm thinking. That's definitely what I'm thinking. Shane Love Coaching says, Throp, I sent an email about a month or two ago. It was brainstorming ideas along the lines what you're talking about. A donation-based option can be considered as well in terms of receiving payment. That's a good idea. Just do an optional donation. Because like, yeah, my first my first instinct was like, oh, let's do this for free, you know. And so and like this kind of gets into the reason why. And and the reason is like what I'm noticing is just like planning these conferences, doing them. And then. You got to get like. You got the you have the experience of like planning the conference and, you know, make it like I'm always focused on the logistics and I'm focused on the experience of the attendees. And there's always concerned about how is that experience is like and are, are we exceeding the expectations of people who are coming online? Are we exceeding the expectations of people who are physically there? You know, and this is why, like, you know, the merch, the branding, the stage setup, like all of this is important, even though the core of it, even though the core of what people are are paying for financially and paying for with their time is the education and is the speakers and is that getting information that they otherwise couldn't get. Or maybe it would take them a much longer time to search the Internet, to make the phone calls, to send the emails. But we instead do put everything under one roof for you. And what you accomplish in, say, five days might has might have taken you maybe years, maybe two years, three years to have done. You can do it in such a short amount of time. And what I realize in the planning of all these things is like having the focus. And, and I think this because it comes from having the focus of like of, of delivering on value. And on the inside part of it is like you're also talking to like many, many companies, I would say many industry leaders, many industry leading companies who whether they want to accept the responsibility or not they are in charge in a in a big way of moving the country forward and they are responsible and have the responsibility of really developing jamaica in the biggest of ways and to me it's not necessarily although these are important but i was gonna say it's not necessarily in the headlines that we see of like oh we, like the government is building this new road or is this new development is happening here and there but it's really the grassroots efforts of a collective group of people 
across the island or across the nation that really move the country forward. So it's really the meetings that are happening in the office of a loan officer. It's really in happening at a lunch or networking event that two people are going to, a group of people that are going to, and of building the confidence with each other, building the trust that they have with each other. And it's these incremental interactions and these inter incremental relationship building and it's these incremental deals that are being made and then executing on those deals. And when, and, and it's going to be hard to see this, but like when you look at, if, if we had a magic wand to lift up the hood of looking into the timeline and process of having an idea of like even maybe building a development or starting a business and then going through the process of putting that thing pen to paper then and i would even say even going before that of like the person who came up with the idea and them having an ed, like going back to high going back to college going back to high school whatever it is like all that is part of like yes the circle of life in a big way but when we look at the engine of execution, a lot of it relies on these institutions and the leaders of these institutions. And specifically, especially like in banking and finance, and then also in, in real estate, it's like they are the ones who uh, are going to make or break the system. And so it's just so important that there, it's, it's to me, that there are strong, capable leaders in those positions even in this in the private sector and then when i talk about the talent pool of of young people and the the, the workforce that we have and the new workforce that's coming it all plays into this like and i and i see it as this like very large matrix and when i am planning an event like throp x you kind of get to see like who's doing what and how certain people are operating. And some of it you're like, wow, it's, it's impressive. And some of it you're like, man, this is how this is how it's done. And you, you, you thought you had this perception of it being a little bit more efficient. And what I realized in planning this event is that there was a large gap of information and also help in facilitating a lot of these goals that people have. And and I feel like I'm just kind of like touching the surface, excuse me, I just like touching the surface of this. And I am like, just the more that I like uh, that I've gone into planning this event and planning this investment conference and, and, and speaking with these different companies and the speakers that we have on, which have all been phenomenal and great, but even you also got to think that the amount of speakers and who we got and the companies that we're working with, I probably talked to, 10x that of what actually came and some obviously worked out very well some didn't work out some what, whatever you know and you once you kind of just start getting looking under the hood and getting a feel of how certain things work systematically you start to understand i was like oh like you just realize like oh this is why this takes so long or this is why we can't move the move certain aspects of the country at a more steadfast pace or a more even keel pace or maybe even put a little jet fuel into it and i think being a facilitator like i didn't really like expect to be have this education have this understanding but the more i do it the more i understand and the more i feel like things and investment conference like throp x are so important hence why i'm like man I think we got to have a webinar to really like it's too, like ThropX is too far, too far of a gap for for 12 months to 12 months. Like I'm like, how can we help people in between? Because to me, again, I think it's going to be us, the private sector and us, the people who have a real vested interest in Jamaica, who are going to move the country forward and who are going to demand a more efficient way of doing things who are going to demand a higher level of professionalism like across the board and if it's not us who is doing it it's just gonna i won't say it's gonna stay the same but it's going to take a lot longer than it could if we are not here and so to me the more that we can bring in ed educate ourselves and use the knowledge and experience that we have collectively and share it amongst ourselves and not wait 12 months of ThropX. And if we could do this more and more, then we're going to get more people into the system. We're going to get more people who 
who believe and maybe at a higher level that they can invest and do well in Jamaica. And that if we can push this a little bit more and move this over to the left a little bit, move this a little bit up here, that we can move the country forward a little bit faster. And the systems that we currently have, certain systems that we currently have in place don't necessarily always have to be that way. And then we are pushing the how things are done in a better, faster way and working with people who just have a higher proficiency, a higher level of, of professionalism, and that who are also going to fight for things to be better, faster, and to attract uh, more and more people uh, with, with like minds. And so again, that was kind of like what I, what I've been learning, uh, this second, second go round. And it's just very interesting to be on this, on this inside track and to have access to just people and, and conversations, discussions that I otherwise wouldn't. And it is again, to, this is con continuing to just just give a little, lend a little bit more understanding of how systems work, how companies work. And uh, it's just a learning process. And again, I'm going to continue to pass on this knowledge and information uh, to as many of you as humanly possible. All right, let's uh, keep going with the uh, comments here. Rachel says, both are great ideas. I attend a lot of online health summits. Oh, thank you. Good. Thank you for that, Rachel. Uh, definitely a fee. Okay. Hear you loud and clear. Kemi Apple says, online summits is the way to go. Then maybe hold in uh, in-person meetups to further build community one to two times a year. I think that's a good idea as well. Natasha Parker says, yes, we will be willing to pay for the network. Um, okay. And hidden developments. Monica Welch says, hi, Throp. Happy Sunday. My favorite YouTube show. Always look forward to this show. You're doing a great job. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much, Monica. I appreciate that. Sherry says, splendid ideas. Natasha Parker says, yes, we're willing to pay for the research, new developments, and networking. Andrew Blake says, hi, Throp. Anything you do to promote our magnificent island and culture is fine by me because you do it with respect and love, and also you want others to experience what you slash we are. Sherry K says, charging a fee is motivational for you and for us to be serious about attending. Thank you, good call, good call. Tisha Moy says, happy Sunday from Florida. Thanks for chiming in. Donna Bryce says, I think that Misty Memphis would also be a valuable guest on that summit. Okay, awesome. We actually have a podcast with her coming out uh, next Saturday. So that will be up and running. And she came to the, I invited her to the, uh, to the all white farewell dinner at Throp X this year. So she was in attendance, but yes, I think she'd be great to have as, uh, as someone on the, for the webinar, webinar, our summit. Natasha Parker says, uh, oh, so hit that already. Oh, well, and willing to pay for the research of Jamaica's monetary policies and law like the Federal Reserves. Jason says, it's not right if China is bringing its own workforce instead of hiring local Jamaicans. I'd be very uh, leery of China. AD Sarah says, would be good to have immigration slash tax lawyers who could advise Canadians, Americans, British citizens to move to Jamaica. Good call. Chris Charles says, perhaps local group in New York, in person, New York, Atlanta, et cetera, and Throp Online with speakers. Hmm. I like that. That's a, that's a good idea. And as you mentioned that, Charles, Chris, sorry. <laughs> I remember I called you Charles before. Uh, we, I'm doing a meetup in London. I'm running in April. So we're going to start planning that together. And uh, I'm going to start reaching out to... Uh, some of you subscribers. I mean, I guess we could do it now. Uh, you know, if uh, we're basically, you know, if anybody out there in the UK has any ideas, um, I got some ideas already about where we could do like a small meetup. I'm going to probably not probably I am going to put out a sign up sheet for a meetup in London. This is um, end of April. And we will uh, the race London Marathon is April 24. Sunday, April 21st. And I'll probably do the meetup after that. 
and we'll just find somewhere that's convenient for everybody to meet. I would love to do like, uh, yeah, the 21st Sunday, the 21st, I would love to do like, uh, a, what would I say? Like maybe I was even thinking of doing like, maybe like a live podcast somewhere. That's another idea. Like me and a team we're, we're working with and just having a bunch of people come out, uh, you know, maybe at like a, a coffee shop. I don't know. We're just like kind of just throwing, throwing things on the wall, see what sticks. So, uh, I'll be reaching out and just kind of maybe, maybe through the, through the email list, reach out to you. But like, if you have any ideas, if you're in the UK and if you could recommend a place that we can reach out to that may be open to it. And we of course would do like, give them a lot of promotion, whatever, whatever business it, it would be. And I would assume it'd be a Jamaican business or Jamaican owned business. It doesn't have to be, but whatever it is. And if they would support us in, in, being a venue and we could do a meetup there. And then we'd, of course, if it's a restaurant or coffee shop, we would support them uh, as, as with meals and drinks and that sort of thing. So uh, we're going to do that in, in April. So just putting that out there, we'll definitely put that in one of the, one of the newsletters coming up. Lily says watching from Philadelphia. Great job you're doing. Thank you very much. Um, Sherry K says one-stop shopping regarding moving back to Jamaica. Excellent job, Throp. Thank you very much. Tisha says, good to know ThropX went well. Loving these ideas regarding an online summit as well. Joe says, is it possible to get a law enforcement person on the panel? I was stopped by the police when I was in Jamaica, and he was telling me a bunch of BS as to why I was stopped. I feel like I don't know my rights in Jamaica. Good question. We actually had a uh, the DSP of Negril, he's head of Negril police station. He was on a panel and I'm sorry, I know you left, uh, left early Joe and wasn't able to stay for the rest of the conference, but, uh, it's, it's funny, uh, Tamika Lawrence, who's one of, he's, she's one of the volunteers. <laughs> she had like a very, like a very similar question. And she, she, she explained her story that she got a ticket for her birthday this year. And uh, she was not along knowing her rights, but it really knowing how to uh, pay for the ticket. And just they got into a lot of lot of details about her particular situation. Uh, but I think your point is well received and is important that we need to just like here in the States, like it's important to know our rights here in the States, in New York or wherever you are. And to do to know that in Jamaica as well. Um, yeah, I hear you on that, Joe, and I think that's a great idea. And we'd want to disseminate that information to as many people as as we possibly can. Uh, Shana says, Thropex on the go. Have local meetup in cities based on analytics from your YouTube, YouTube channel. Shana, you always coming up with these great ideas. I'm screenshotting that one. <laughs> Andrew Blake says, London in April, you have to email. Let me know uh, what you need. Okay, I will. I will, uh, Andrew. Let me screenshot this. Yep, I'll, I will let you know. I'll be reaching out more forcefully <laughs> or more intently, I would say, uh, shortly, probably after the holidays. I'll definitely send it out before in the newsletter before the year ends. So we could kind of get things rolling and really start planning this thing out. G Williams says, great job overall watching from New Orleans. We'll soon come to TBR. Awesome. Looking forward to having you. Yes, Travelers Beach Resort. Okay. Uh, I think that's it. Good, good ideations. Mr. Heavy Transport says, wow, I just ran into the live. Big up to Throt people. Good to have you. Okay. So let's get into all right, one more comment and then we'll get into the stream. Uh, Jason Wilson says a lot can happen over a year in Jamaica. So having an online summit earlier in the year would be a great idea. I like idea number one. You should throw in an early bird package deal for Thropex 2024. You know, we were we wanted to do that this year, but we just weren't organized. Like we may still do something of this nature. 
of uh, like we wanted to make like give like an exclusive deal for people who were in attendance to uh, book early, but we're just not as organized as we would like to. Cause, and like one of the main things that was holding us back is uh, it's concerns about expansion. And so, you know, we probably with the venue as travelers, we probably can only take maybe another 20 people. And that could be pushing it. Like, and um, the room, the room itself was was healthy. You know, it was a healthy amount of people. It wasn't overcrowded. Everybody had enough space. But you know, I don't think, and especially with the plans that we have to to grow a little bit larger. Um, uh, and I was like, I don't, I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't know if we we can take like we didn't want to start my point is like we didn't want to start advertising and collecting funds for next year without having a plan like what if we have like 30 or 40 more people sign up and then we go over capacity and then we have to start turning people away or we're forced to find a new venue like we don't want to do that so we didn't have a plan so we didn't start selling like these early bird tickets um yeah but maybe we'll do once we have a confident plan maybe we we'll, would we will do that for next year um the other thing and then i don't know people may not like this but i think this is this came up multiple times and uh i'm curious to hear what people think so i knew last year when we did it i knew the price was very low it was uh 599 i think it was 600 dollars, and i knew it was like i was planning a conference that was going to lose money and i was fine with that because i was very nervous about whether this thing was actually going to take off and my whole thing was like oh if it like completely flops at least people can say it's like oh it's only 600 dollars, or they got more than what they paid for sort of thing and this year we essentially doubled the price and uh i thought it was i was also nervous about that we went 2x what we did last year and i'm like you know are people going to be willing to pay this it's a lot of money and I got multiple different people that I spoke with. They like, like hushed me, pulled me aside and like quietly said, you're not charging enough for this. And they just couldn't believe how much value that they got from the conference. And mind you, and maybe I didn't do a good job of this, but every meal was included. If you stay, sorry, if you stayed at Travelers, like every meal was included in your, um, in your conference package, there are some people who uh, like own property that's not a, not not at Travelers or stayed at their favorite hotel, and they came for the conference and they had breakfast there, uh, or they paid for breakfast at Travelers if they weren't staying with us. But all meals were included in the conference package, and and I think that that was one of the. Uh, the meals itself, I think people were impressed with. And, you know, shout outs to travelers for really putting out like every meal was really well done. Every dinner we had was a different venue. Uh, we were supposed to have one dinner at on the beach, but it, we had a tropical depression that we had to we had to fight through and we couldn't do that. But we we had th that was also important is like like again, going back to the importance of having a high level deliver on value conference, like right across the board, even again, outside of the education. And what I also realized is that it was important to me is like a lot of things happen in the downtime. A lot of things happen with people just walking by each other on the pathway to the conference or to and from their rooms and they'll stop and have a conversation and already right, happen in, in at breakfast or our dinner and so like those interactions that you just can't plan for that are going to be serendipitous and that just happen maybe it's on the bus uh so uh, you, you to me it was also into important to uh create opportunities for interaction like of that nature to happen like very very important and the only way to do that was to have like all the meals included and so anyway uh yeah i was told like to do that um 
you know, it's costly on the cost side of things to make that happen and to have the meat because also I didn't want to skimp on the meals either. You know, I didn't want to give out peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for breakfast, lunch and dinner <laughs> just because we were charging like a nominal fee. And then but when you break it down, like I thought that it was like high value for money, even from a just coming on vacation alone perspective, you know, that's that's the way it was explained to me. And I was like, OK, that makes sense. So. You know, will the price go up next year? Uh, I'm not sure. We'll we'll see. It's something that we're considering. Um, if it is, maybe it'll go up slightly. But that was one piece of feedback. But I'm also open to, especially people who are there. That's going to be part of our survey uh, that that we'll send out this week. As a matter of fact, just to get feedback on value for money, which is just top top priority. Like say, like, and I just get this from being in the, being in a hotel. I remember like one hotel year. Uh, I don't know if you know Anthony Magakari. I, I believe that's his last name. He was um, he did that show Hotel Impossible, and they were looking to do it at Travelers, but we said no. I'm very thankful we didn't do that show. And uh, we had dinner when they they came down for the premiere. They chose another hotel and the grill, and we had dinner with him. And the one thing that sticks out with me this was like man, probably like six seven years ago. The one thing that has sticked out with me, which is hanging out with him, and he's like, ah, what's the exact words? But basically, as a hotelier, like your number one job is to essentially exceed the expectations of your guests and really say, like, you want to have your guests, like, say you, you charge $50 a night for your hotel, you want them to leave and say, like, wow, I can't believe I only paid $50 for this hotel. I would have paid $150. And so like ever since I had that conversation with with him and like me and my brother the same way, like we want to over deliver on the experience like at Travelers. And that's something that we we constantly work towards like every single day. And I brought that same approach to to ThropX. And I want to continue to do that. You know, I want people to have say like, hey, I paid $1,200. And they're like, man, this is worth way, way more. I got way more out of this. And I don't want people to feel like, they got ripped off or they were like, man, this is not worth it and didn't get the value. Like, not, I don't even want to be close to that. I just want to continuously, as, as much as within my control, is just blow the expectations out the water of people. And, uh, you know, this is without, it's a business for sure, but this is not a money grab at any, any point. I think the mission at hand is far more important than that. To me, the, 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 the monetary aspect of it just allows me and us to continue to do the work that I feel like needs to be done and to really fill this gap, this need that is becoming more and more apparent that is there in the market. So uh, again, just a, just another idea I throwing out there. And for those who attended in person, that'll, that'll be a part of the, the survey as well. Uh, let's get to some, some comments here. Jason says, or I'm going to save that comment. We'll come back to that, Jason. Um, I guess says, hi, Throp. Looking forward to April. Let me know what you need, and I will do my utmost to help. Uh, so if you could, I know it's a little lazy of me. Uh, Miguel, if you could just, as an Andrew, I know Andrew Blake, if you could just shoot me an email just so I know to reach out to you. I just don't have any way of reaching out to you directly. Um, if you're going to shoot me an email with, I don't know how to pin a comment. I should know this, right? Uh, but if you can shoot me an email with just your contact information and I'll reach out to you to uh, see how you might be able to assist in planning for the London April meetup. Patria says, hey, Throp, tuning in from Florida. Nice to see you. Nia TV says, hello from North Carolina. Nice to see you. Sherry says, building excellent customer service is needed in almost every sector, especially banking. In a big, big way. And it's, it's again, I, I firmly believe we have to push this. And I don't think when, when, especially in, in what we're talking about and what we're trying to accomplish here, when I say, when you say customer service, that's, that is like, I don't necessarily mean or interpret it 
like uh like having a good attitude or having a smile like yes all that is important but it's also customer service is the efficiency in which you do your job how focused you are on it how important is the customer experience to you as a customer service representative and that really starts from the head down and so these are the elements of the system and the experience that we need to demand that that we the consumers that we the people are find important so that's when i hear the words customer service that that's automatically where my mind goes to onia wellington hey says hey everyone happy sunday happy sunday to you as well uh sherry says thanks for your professionalism absolutely shana of coaching says i think it was reasonable price for the experience also the a la carte option to attend day passes if uh, was priced higher it would be still worth it high quality and top tier production thank you very much Shana, for that i appreciate it and we're all like we have like some crazy like not crazy ideas but just a lot of ideas that we are just thinking about like how can we how can we top this how can we get this even bigger how can we deliver more um from an experience standpoint um there was uh i don't mean to like put down like i i i'm not trying to put down on um another conference but there i don't know if you know if you've heard, anybody's heard of afrotech i think it was in atlanta this year and i saw an article with a lot of the feedback saying like this was they like people weren't getting the value out of what i thought was a very important conference and it's this uh as the name entails a, a tech conference for for black people and uh it just it, it seemed like at least from the article that i read it seemed like it missed the mark i'm like man i just kind of never want to be in a position like that and i go to these conferences i go to i've been to many probably hundreds at this point of conferences in my life and I take a lot of the elements that I experience at different conferences around the world, and I brought that to ThropX. And there are many, many more ideas that I want to bring to ThropX. Uh, going off of another conference, I went to uh, Vid Summit in October with Candice, and this is my third or fourth time going to this conference. This is a YouTube conference, and they just went to. And this is another fear I have as well this was a conference that i went to over the years that was a very small intimate conference and when i say small i'm talking about like a few thousand people like a thousand something maybe two thousand some maybe no more than two thousand people but i think it was a lot less than that and this year they grew and they moved to like this huge convention center in dallas and it was like thousands and thousands of people and so this conference went from small intimate youtube conference where like i met so many youtubers like youtubers with like 10 tens of millions of followers million followers uh 100 followers subscribers and it, it felt it had such like a family feel to it and that's what made me love it and it was very intimate you knew so many people every every one of those conferences that i went to there's somebody that i still talk to and i'm still in touch with to this day that i call my friend and this year it wasn't like that at all it was just like huge and it was just like man like the feel of it was just gone it just lost this even though it was like say a thousand people in the years prior but like going from a thousand to three thousand or four thousand i guess that's a big difference and it was just like also <laughs> I would say this for all YouTubers, but I speak for myself. Like, you know, you're a little, you're just like an introvert. At least I would say for myself, like I'm an introverted person, like, you know, and, and being in a, a large crowd like that and trying to find my way and trying to find my tribe and meet people. It was just so intimidating. And I met a lot of people who went to prior conferences who had the same experience at this year's. And my point in, in saying that is it's like when I look at my own conference and the the importance of the work that we are doing in this community and in this in this conference space, I'm like, ah, do I want to get to that point? You know, I really feel and like I opened my speech at ThropX was this that everybody in that room has to know everybody in that room. And I think that is so important because we're just such uh, we're a small group of like-minded individuals but i feel like we're a very powerful group and to lose that 
for the sake of like you know building this thing as much and as far as it can grow i don't know i don't know if i would like to do that because i was like it was not a nice feeling going to vid summit this year and i was like man i was just like so surprised and candice came with me this was her second year coming and she said the same thing and it just just felt different and it felt like it wasn't for us and it felt honestly it felt like man the it's like I got value out of it for sure, but I felt like they were just going after the money, you know, and I was like, man, I never want my conference to turn into something like that. I want it to be this very safe space for people who have just have Jamaica first in mind that want to invest and learn about investing in Jamaica. And I think again, when I think about process, when I think about the journey of different people uh, going along their in investment journey and I always think about people who are coming into this loop or who are coming into this fold and people are going to come into this fold in all different parts of their life. And it's good. Sometimes it's going to be an 18 year old kid who found Jamaica at an early age that has no affiliation with Jamaica whatsoever, but came in here on a vacation with his family when he was eight years old. And hey, I want to live here and move to Jamaica. And they're going to use the Throp community and ThropX to help them figure out how to do this. Then on the other end, you have people who've been away for 40 years and who, who was born and raised in Jamaica, but left here when they were 15 years old and went and worked abroad, got their education abroad, but they're ready to move back and invest in Jamaica. And I want this conference to be a place where those two individuals can come together, find common ground, have a good relationship, learn from each other. And of course, learn from the speakers that we have there as well. But it's so important is, is the community and Again, it's just like these le these are like just lessons learned that I, I have from going through these different experiences and going to these uh, different conferences. Uh, so, yeah, don't want to. Don't want to get to get to that level at any point, I was going to say anytime soon, but don't want to get to that to that. I, I don't want uh, this conference to lose its essence and to lose the reason why we started this whole thing in in the first place all right we got to get to we really got to get to today's subject uh let me just breeze through these comments i know i keep saying this i'm gonna try to breeze through these comments really quick and then we'll get into our discussion Roshane tucker bless up sir keep up the good work thank you Roshane. appreciate it etv says i'm late to the conversation no you just on time Joe says, I'm so happy you had uh, a fish option at dinner. I don't eat meat. Absolutely. And ETV says, what's the event uh, that's going to be the cost thrown, thrown and what's the cost? Uh, the, so this is, the, we've been initially talking about the online, potential of an online event, online summit. Uh, the cost, I'm not sure, but it's going to be nominal. It's going to be the, uh, if this is what you're referring to, it's going to be nominal. If you're referring to Thropx 2024, I don't know the, the price for that. Patrice Davis says, uh, I'm moving back soon. Another option for ThropX 2024 is a workshop on how to launch and grow an online business for those who want to continue earning from the US or, or uh, Canada. I'm happy to be on the panel. Thank you for that. I think that's a great idea. I think that is a great idea. Dr. Michelle says, I'm late to the party. Happy Sunday, everyone. Good to have you. Kemi Apple says, for in-person conference, the pricing I see most often ranges between 2000 and 2500 Yeah, I was looking at, let me read your comment first, Shana, before I, I hop in. Um, if you're concerned about your rates, offering a different packages based on uh, tiers levels of what will be included, for example, 2000 everything included, 1200 doesn't include breakfast, and et cetera. Gotcha. No, good idea. Uh, and says, as well as uh, keeping day passes as an option. Um, and please listen to Shana. If you haven't already, please hit the like button. Yeah, this is a, these are good ideas, uh, Kami and Shana. Uh, I I've been looking at like, you know, retreats and conferences around the world. And we are definitely on the low end. And then also, again, with the value for money, like if you just just think about you know just food transportation everything included and that's what i want and i want to i never want it to be like you know you're just almost right meeting parity so to speak of like you're getting the exact value for money like no it, it's i always want it to be like i can't even if it is three thousand dollars 
you're, you know, and which that's not where we're going to, I promise. Um, even if it is that much, I want it to be like, I would have paid $10,000 or this is worth $15,000 or something like that, you know, and that, and if I can't meet or exceed that ratio, we're not even going to touch that. We're not even going to go to that level. So, uh, you know, I guess, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out, but that's my mentality going into it. Jenny Strassen says, uh, hello, Throb. Just got here. Greetings from UK. Awesome. Nice to have you. Dirty Vibe says, uh, you all need to pay attention to Chris Christiana Manchester. I visited that place and it is the G spot of Jamaica. Never heard of it, but okay. Uh, Joe says, customer service in J. Ha. Have, uh, have to come to terms with poor customer service experience in Jamaica. Uh, if not, I will continue to live in the states annoy state of annoyance in Jamaica. Um, yeah, I mean, sad admission. Um, but yeah, that that is definitely can be a ch can be a, a challenge uh, living living here, being in Jamaica. But I would say, I will say, from a competitive standpoint, if you have a business or you offer a service or whatever it is, if you do offer, I would say, basic customer service to your customers, you're going to kill your, your, I mean, you're going to blow your competition out the water. You're going to do so well. You know, if you make that like a top priority of your business, and this could be, it could be a product-based business. Um, this could be a service-based business, like a hospitality or whatever it is, you know, but if you, if you're saying, if you tell yourself that customer service is a one top priority, you're going to do exceptionally well because, uh, you know, it's just, it's not the norm, I would say in Jamaica. I mean, it's just the reality. It just isn't. It just, it just, it just really, really isn't. It's, it's not, I think the hospitality industry is a little bit different because we put so much emphasis on it. And there is a baseline of expectation. If you're going to a hotel or if you take a taxi, um, a, a Judas certified taxi, uh, I would say, and you go to maybe a waterfall and they're dealing with the public. I think, uh, I don't want to butcher this, but I think this is just kind of going into our, um, our discussion today. Dr. Kerry Wallace, he gave the keynote speech at Thropex farewell dinner, the all white party. And he was talking about, I'm just going to take a snippet of his speech. And he was talking about the innate incentive that was created with Airbnb to be uh, a customer service first economy and society. And I forget the term. If somebody was there who can remind me of the term he was using, but he was basically saying that with Airbnb, uh, let me build a little context here, but with Airbnb, we're talking about that was uh, one of a theme in ThropX uh, because the government, Jamaican government, is now looking at taxing Airbnb. Right now, there it is not being taxed. And I think the people, Airbnb owners, even the realtors were saying that taxing Airbnb revenue is a good thing. And this is something that we all should support because uh, those tax revenues would now go towards helping build the country, fix roads, and just increase the government financial coffers uh, across the board. And Kerry, Dr. Wallace was uh, also making the point that now everybody can now become part of the go for, going from the informal economy to the formal economy. And now Jamaica, you're seeing Jamaicans move from this bad, um, I'm being forced to use my patois here, uh, basically moving from the mentality as like, me is a bad man, and I'm going to operate my life as such across the board. And you can't tell me anything. And like, this is the mentality that we that we have as maybe, maybe young people. And so it used to be, and, and this is what he was saying, it used to be we bring this bad man mentali mentality and execute it in all aspects of, of our life, whether we're dealing with uh, 
you know, a, a person that wronged you in a family or a friend or whatever it is, and you retaliate accordingly. But now with Airbnb, if somebody has, say, even an extra room in their home or on their yard, they can rent it out and they can collect revenue from that from a tourist. And what that does, it forces them to have a higher level of self-accountability because now there is an international public rating system of one to five stars. And you, whether a bad man or otherwise, who is now able to make revenue that they otherwise couldn't, are incentivized to ensure from a customer service standpoint that the guest that you have at your property, in your home, on your couch or whatever it is, is a good one. Because if they go back home and give you a one star review, that is going to bring down your potential or opportunity to earn further income in the future because you get a bad review. And so the idea is that you want to ensure as much as possible within your power that you give the best possible service you can to that person and you want to do that over and over again so you can get five star five star five star and you can get more and more people coming to your property and coming to your business and he was making the argument that that airbnb has revolutionized the mindset of the average jamaican or at least those who are part of this now formal economy the airbnb economy and they are incentivized to make customer service be a priority and part of of who they are as a person and i thought that was a, a very smart way of of putting it and so i know joe this is not what you're talking about but i to me i think that there is a lot of merit to what uh dr wallace was saying and i think it does move us and like I was saying earlier and open up with, like these, these are incremental steps that we're taking moving towards uh, a better society as a whole. And I think Airbnb gives an opportunity to do that and to bring people into the formal economy. And as uh, you know, I do think that Airbnb in Jamaica will be taxed and I think it should be taxed. And we're travelers on Airbnb and yeah, we'll get taxed for it. And that's that's fine. And I think a lot of people who have properties wouldn't have an issue with that. All right, a lot of, a lot of comments here. Uh, let's keep going. Empress Flame says, hearing about the needs of JA is valuable. Yes, small groups are better. <clears throat> Joe says, uh, keep ThropX small and intimate, please. I will, I, I will do as long as I can. Uh, Sherry K says, full group presentations, then breakout ro rotation sessions could control the size of the groups and allow attendees to choose presentations they are interested in. So that's I think that's where we're, we're pretty much there um, next year. Another idea is like we were thinking about actually um, extending like we went five days this year and it just wasn't enough. Uh, you know, there were there were day there was a day of the Friday day. I think it was the Friday, which was the last day, you know, people, it was mostly the, the day was social, but people took the day to go open bank accounts, you know, and I thought that was phenomenal. I thought that was great. That was excellent. Uh, but I think people need time, need a day to actually go and do business, you know, and I think there are people who need to get a TRN. There are people who need to open a bank account and want to like, they'll, they'll have the, the, the education sessions. <clears throat> And then they learn about this thing that they want to do. And instead of like going home and coming back to Jamaica, they just want to do it. So uh, what I also realized is like we need to have a facilit a day for facil facilitating the execution of what we talked about. And so even like, say, going to get your TRN, how can we expedite that process? You know, how can we work with the uh the taj the tax administration of jamaica to help people in a very easy and seamless way like if we have 10 15 people who come to the conference that don't have a trn but they want to open a bank account they want to invest open an investment account how can we get it so like they there's no lines for them and they they, they can just get this thing done in the limited amount of time that they have there in jamaica and negro same thing with opening a bank account how can we facilitate them that they don't have to spend half a day in the bank doing this and like, but we make sure they bring their paperwork, their IDs, et cetera, et cetera. And 
we can take a group of people down to the bank or maybe they can do it at the conference itself. So these are the things that I think about, like how can we continue to add value and just layer on top of layer of adding value of the conference. So uh, yeah, good suggestion, Sherry. Joe says, I hope for the best. Uh, sorry, that's you guys having a conversation. Miss Cole says, I don't uh, go to Jamaica looking for good customer service. If anything, I gear it to be equally as feisty. <laughs> that is funny. Um, Corey MPA says, Throp, impossible to keep this small. The nature of this will only mean it's going to be larger and larger. I say accept it and make it as great as possible. Thank you very much, Corey. Um, that might that might very well be the case. Uh, thank you for that. Ms. Cole says, I had to put someone in their place on my last trip because of my youthful appearance. They think I'm a kid. She was shocked when I opened my mouth to her. <laughs> Julia, what's going on? Good to see you. Hello from Hollywell Park, Blue Mountains. Awesome. Shana says, I drop our included payment plan option for individuals to make payments over time up into the conference. Yes. So, uh, with our research, we understood that this is a very viable way of doing things because sometimes people just don't have, you know, 1300 bucks to fork out right on the spot. I get that. We are definitely going to do payment plans um, for next year. 100%. Thank you for that, Shana. All right. Chelsea Clinton says, I'd rather deal uh, with poor customer service than racism. Fair enough. M dash cube, what's going on? All right. M dash cube says, uh, I've been to several Airbnb places that got bad reviews, and it's not true, but rating affects them. Janice Moore says, it doesn't matter how much taxes the government collects, healthcare, education, and infrastructure remain. The same because all politicians have to get their pockets lined first. No accountability. I say to that, like the accountability, like it's us, up to us to hold them accountable. Uh, if you believe that that's what's happening and you believe that uh, Jamaica suffers from elements of, of what you just said at a high level that really holds back the country. Um, and so at the end of the day, I think, you know, from your local government to the MP, to the different ministers to the prime minister like it's up to us like we have to we have to hold them accountable we have to you know and i think if we and like this is i i was saying this like an hour ago like when i were first opening up and we were talking about how the country moves forward and it, to me it's like these incremental decisions these incremental interactions that we have with one another and I was talking about this with Throp X and kind of being on the inside and lifting up the hood of how some of these organizations work and how they communicate and how they make decisions. And you're like, oh, and like, and this is like my personal experience, like, oh, you, like this is why it's like this. And this is why it's like that. And so even from a customer service standpoint and what we accept and what we expect as a customer of any institution and like it's up to us to say something and it, and same goes for our government institutions like if we're not satisfied or we we know that there is a better way or we think that we're getting screwed in one way or another like it's up to us to say like hey this is unacceptable this needs to change and we do something about it Jason says the people will continue to suffer as long as the British monarchy holds control of the money bill not right why Canada is suffering to all profits getting sent back to Br Britain. Uh, Jenny Stratton says, Strashen, sorry, uh, have uh, set days when people come to get their TRN open bank accounts. More promotion needs to be done to promote returnees and incentives. I agree. This is also a theme on a few of the panels. Uh, they were asking basically like how do we get more like, like more of the diaspora into the fold and how you know and there were different ideas put out about how uh, certain government agencies can do or create a little bit more incentives for uh for the diaspora to move back to jamaica mno says excellent idea about uh, day to facilitate banking tier and etc. If those government agencies could be in an attendance at Thropex would be fantastic. 
oh, excuse me, we had them. We had we we did have them. Uh, but I think we just need to do a little bit more prep and outreach to help facilitate. We tried it for this year, but it just didn't work out. Uh, we were trying to trying to get it to the point where you can open a bank account on property at the conference. Like th this is where we need to go. This is where we need to get to. Like we have a group of motivated people who want to invest, who want to open a bank account, who want to start a business. Can we do it right there on the spot? I don't see why not. I don't see why not. And to me, it's just like, there's no reason why we can't have that right happen on the spot. Like, so now I have a little less than a year, but now I can work on like, how do we figure this process out together? How do we have, we have 12 months, we have 11 and a half months to figure this out with ABC bank, with ABC government agency. How can we facilitate? How can we work this out, put things in place from now so that the people who come to the conference who are motivated, who have the cash to put into the bank or maybe even invest in a property. And, and I'm also talking to the real estate companies as well and the real estate lawyers out there is like, how can we get this process started right there on the spot? Because offers were made right after we did the real estate tour. People, people uh, put in offers on property that they went in, they saw, I want it, what do we got to do? And, and and things are in process and, and they are in progress. And I believe these deals will happen in the next few months. But now, like while we have them in person at the conference in the grill, how can we mitigate against or at least take away some of the steps that would have to be done over the internet and maybe that would take a week, we can do in just a few minutes because that person is right in front of us. And so like, this is my, this is my, this is my thought process because again, going back to like how the system is set up to do these things, especially from, if you're abroad, it like, it like I look at this and we may be just looking at this as like a one-on-one -on -one transaction. Oh, they're only buying a, a one bedroom apartment or they're only buying this quarter acre piece of land. But like if we think about it, how many other people who are out there, maybe there are hundreds or thousands of people who are trying to do the same thing. Maybe those out of the thousand people, there is 200 just don't have the patience to go through the rigmarole that's created by bureaucracy of the system. And so how do we get that 200 people who just leave from frustration and get that down to zero? Or maybe we get that down to one. And to me, like these are the kind of, like, this is the mentality I think that we need in the approach of how do we make this system better? You know, how do we make it more efficient? Because I know, again, it, it may just be that one bedroom apartment that they're, that they're buying, but like, imagine we can make that process so much more efficient and we get it down from argument's sake, from three months to one month. That's that that much more business that you can do in that time. And time is our greatest asset that we have right across the board. Every human being, we have this limited asset asset that we cannot buy any more of. And so time is money. We all know that. How do we bring these processes down to make them quicker, to make them more efficient? How do we do that? And like to me, it's just like, we just have to push the envelope. And just because it's the way it is and has been, doesn't it mean that it will always be that way? And to me, this is like, this is how we make things better. This is how we make things more efficient. We have to demand it. And so uh, I'm going to, I'm going to continue to push this and try to figure these things out because there, there are some people who are just not going to have that patience, you know, and we did there we all know that there are better ways of doing things and especially for those who have maybe had experience uh, abroad for an extended period of time like these ideas like we need to bring them back we need to bring them to jamaica all right let's keep going here king naldo what is going on thank you for the donation really really appreciate you king naldo says customer service training should extend to basic proper sanitary enforcement as in the case of miss alice uh defecating in her stall while selling crabs terrible 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 i mean yes 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 like like there's there's no argument there there's no argument whatsoever and sanitary 
I mean, just being a sanitary person, individual people, uh, it just like I think all I always think back to like my dad and the importance that he instilled into us of having like a, a clean environment on our home, but also us, me and my brothers, that is taking responsibility of having a clean room. And to him, that really was a reflection of our our cleansliness as kids right cleansiness is next to godliness my dad said that all the time and yeah that that mentality i mean from that standpoint from a sanitation standpoint like that really starts at starts at home and of course extends into customer service and it has to be like right across the board right across the board and that's a unfortunate like it got to we even have to be talking about that that's crazy Jason says, Jason's talking about the British monarchy still. Okay, we're going to leave you with that, Jason. Uh, M. Noel says, uh, my parents are Jamaican and I was born slash raised in the UK. But since finding you on YouTube, I have learned so much about Jamaica and thinking about moving to Jamaica. Awesome. We'd love to have you do that. Um, Shana says also a few attendees went on private real estate on their own time as well with the realtors and investors that attended the conference. Yeah. And like, to me, like, like I, when I heard that, I was like, that's amazing. That's amazing. Like, that's exactly what I want to have happen. And some of these, I was saying this in my, my farewell speech on, on the Friday. And kind of what we're talking about today, it's like these companies, like they, again, whether they accept the responsibility or not, they hold the keys to the progress of our country. And I'm not saying that they're bad at their job or anything like that, but it's, I think it's just more, it's just very important that we continue to work together, I guess, is the, is, is the point I'm trying to make here. And I would love to be working with more real estate companies and realtors. But as I said in uh, ThropX, these are the three realtors that I've been working with who I personally think they get this. They get what we're trying to do in the Throp community. They understand it. They believe in it. And I'm just going to continue to work with them and continue to push it. And they're going to make sales. They're going to... And again, it's, it's not about the money for them. Maybe it is, <laughs> but I don't think so. I think the money incentivizes them, but they are very good at what they do. And they also understand the platform and the community that we've built here, and they want to help facilitate it. And they want to be a facilitator of helping you all achieve your dreams and your goals. And some people don't get it. And this is a long-term thing. And this is what I explain to all of the realtors that I work with. And this is we're playing the long game. We're playing the long game here. Jamaica is not going to turn into Jamaica that we'd all love to see overnight. It's not going to happen next year either. Everybody I work with, they're thinking in spans of 10 years. And we have to. And we can't be short-minded. But we, like everybody I speak with that I'm working with, they understand that we are building a very, very strong foundation. And eventually, all the hard work that we're putting in now is going to pay off and is going to benefit the future of Jamaica and just so many people. I'm just going to, again, I'm just going to continue to work with these people who are, who, who get it. And I'm going to work very, very hard for them as well, because to me, they've committed so much uh, time and energy to this community. I'm going to do the same for them in a big way, in a big, big way, because again, they get it and they understand it. And so I really hope I'm setting an example here because I, and I'm not trying to say like, Hey, look at me or anything like that, but the model that we have, like it is working, we are making a difference. And I be, I truly believe we're doing it for the right reasons and really for the right people at the end of the day. So hearing uh, when I heard about these realtors going off on their own on these on a, on a day outside of the real estate tour to go look at the same property or look at other properties like man, like this is what it's about. This is what it's about. Whether a deal comes out of it or not, I don't know. But the fact that people we have a group of very serious highly motivated people who again think and put jamaica first means the world to me honestly and that we're all under the same roof means the world to me 
Miguel says, speaking of banks, there seems to be a lot of cases online where NCB customers are allegedly losing money from their accounts. Do you know whether these are isolated incidents or this is widespread? I don't know. I can't speak to that. I, I know what you're talking about. I've heard of these cases, but I honestly don't know. Uh, we had NCB at the conference. And this question was asked and it came up and they were basically saying, like, what is happening is basically customers are getting tricked to click a link or some, or some basically they're getting tricked into giving away sensitive information about their account and because of that domino effect, they have been losing their money. And initially, they were returning returning these fees, these the, these fees that they got the customers got scammed out of back to the customer. But it, it was happening so often that they could no longer do it. So, you know, I, again, I don't, outside of that statement and outside of the panel with NCB, I like I don't really know much about it, but I do get a lot of emails and text messages from banking institutions, the banking institutions that I bank with about just being careful. Don't click. We don't send you links. Uh, never give away your password. Never give away your username. All of these things. So it seems like that the scammers are sending out links are they're, they're they're coming up with ways to get sensitive information about individual accounts and that's how these things are or at least one of these things are one of the way these things are happening Ms. Noel says excellent ideas as one cocoa filler basket my mom says there you go and listen to M. Knowles, please hit the like button. Thank you. M. Dash said, I don't think customer service training can really help that situation. It's called uh, brought up. See, it boils down to how you were raised. Kind of, kind of what I was saying. Kind of what I was saying. M. Dash says, it's a cultural saying. Hashtag mindset. Simone says, greetings, Throp and Throppers from Atlanta. Good to see you, Simone. Janice says, Throp, you and Sir P needs to run for PM with an independent party. The other two parties are not about nation building. No politics for me. Not even entertaining it for a second at all. Rohan says, yeah, after the main tour, we brought some attendees to our development in Lucy. And they all want to buy. Unfortunately, we don't have enough units. Yeah, I was taking a look at your website, uh, I think, yesterday. Rohan, uh, good stuff. Yeah, and I heard about a few people going with you to your development. And that's awesome. Want to support you guys with that as well. What you're doing looks really, really awesome. And that's kind of what I foresee happening, developments of your size that people are going to be interested in. And, and we just need more of those, uh, more of those developments uh, because specifically you know you have this ocean point in lucy but in the grill there's not a lot of land space to do an ocean point which ocean point has hundreds of units over there uh so it's uh yeah uh m dash is asking for your uh your website rohan uh yeah throw me your website rohan and i'll throw it up here you guys can take a look at it rohan and his partner or at thropx and they're doing a development in lucy uh, just throw it in the comments and I'll throw it up on the on the screen here, Rohan. King Nalo says, United Oil has found a drilling partnership in an unnamed company to possibly start drilling for oil in the new year and beyond. This is a game changer the, uh, the Jamaican economy needs for uh, as uh, it's for Guyana. Agreed. Yeah, that would be crazy. That would be really crazy. Okay. All right, we didn't even get into the subject. All right, I think we're going to take a quick break here. I need to get out some more videos here. All right, we're going to take a quick break. I'm going to... Um, sorry, get a phone call.
out. We're gonna take a quick break. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to choose which video. I mean, I guess we could. Man, should I do the driving video? I think I feel like so many people saw the driving video already. Maybe I'll just do the last part for. No, no, we're gonna do part one of the driving video. I think people like this. All right, we'll be right back and take a quick break. Hello and welcome. If this is your first time visiting, a special welcome to you. We got a special feature today. We are doing a driving tour of Negril, Jamaica, particularly focusing on the West End. And this is a bit of a long video. It's about 38, 40 minutes. And depending on where you're watching it, this will be in different parts or one long video. My name is Winthrop Wellington, by the way, and here on my channel, we really discuss all things Jamaica. But today, as I mentioned, we're going to be doing a bit of tour of Negril. And we're just going to flow with it. We're just going to flow with it and see where this takes us. So we are starting this tour off on Norman Manley Boulevard, otherwise known as the Beach Road at Travelers Beach Resort, which is my family's hotel. And of course, we got to wait for the traffic. But of course, there on the left side of your screen, that is our NEAT Resource Center, or the Negril Education Environment Trust Resource Center. Uh, NEAT is my family's nonprofit organization, which focuses on education for young people. So right now, we're heading south on Norman Bailey Boulevard. Pretty beautiful day, as you can see. I don't know what the temperature was when we, when we filmed this, but... <laughs> It was it was nice. It was a nice day. And so we're heading towards downtown Negril. And on your left is the shared user path. So that's running, walking, biking. And that goes for a little bit over two miles. To your right is the Negril Beach Park. Uh, it has a basketball court and the beach, of course, and just really open space. Unfortunately, it's closed right now. They are or they have plans to do some refurbishing and then we just passed the community Grill community center and they were also passing the craft market on your right side and this is the south negro river and bridge and we're heading to the negro roundabout of course going into the roundabout you have to give way and if you're in the roundabout you have the right of way and we are going west end so we're going to be taking a right here at the roundabout and veering left and so here downtown this is uh, a few shopping centers if you will there's little caesar's pizza on the right popeyes burger king there's a digicel store down here as well and on the left coming up is scotia bank which some people might be familiar with, depending on where you are from, but it's a Canadian bank. And I guess officially, this is where the West End of Negril starts. And on your left here is Corner Bar, which is a pretty popular restaurant. Great, great local food. Haven't had it in a while, but the reviews continue to be, to be very, very good. And on the left, that's Fenders Plaza. That's the Negril Chamber of Commerce uh, owned plaza. And on the right, obviously, we have the C. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we panned right, but it's you basically can see the entirety of Negril on the right hand side if you were to look right. You need to get a 360 camera next time, right? Anyway, on the left is the Negril Post Office, not in the greatest of shapes, but that is our post office. And then right after that is Samuel's Hardware on the left. And that's, I would say, probably the most popular hardware store in Negril. Uh, mostly every business uses them. And then on the left, the green building, that's Quality Traders. That's where I do my grocery shopping. Been going there for years. And then we're coming up on the, I guess what used to be the high low value, high low value master NCB Plaza, but uh, NCB and high low moved. So that's no longer there. And that place is being refurbished. And this is called Church Corner. As we move through the West End.
just cruising, just cruising. And this is the Negril Library on the left, and then followed by Negril All Age School. And then this is another hardware store on the left. Hope you guys are enjoying this so far. I'm just, I'm just following with it. And as I see things, I want to point them out to you. On the right is the Negril Yacht Club, which is for sale. Hopefully, uh, should be doing a video on that. Hopefully, sometime soon. Canoe Bar is on the right. It's pretty much the only property on the west end that has a beach. Good food there. Haven't been there in a while either, but uh, the food is pretty good. used to be a German bar but I don't know what it is now but boats used to pull up there they used to have a really good pizza this used to be boat bar on the right but it changed into something else I'm not sure what it is what it is now and then Millard is on the left and if you know Millard um, that's 24 hours place good food as well and then Patsy's is on the right so they do uh, it's, I think it's basically the only standalone coffee shop in the grill and they do good pastries, good lunch. I did a live stream from there and also did a video with them as well for the channel, which was cool. This is Ocean Cliff on the right we just passed. I did the farewell dinner there for Thropex 2022. Beautiful pop property, formerly known as the Spa Retreat. But beautiful property, great food that we had there for the for the uh, farewell dinner retreat. And here on the West End, like it's a very different experience than the beach. As you can see, like it's very you're it's 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 I wouldn't say uh, secluded maybe too strong of a word, but definitely when you're on the properties, it's a little bit more secluded and separated. Uh, as compared to the beach where there's just more traffic and no real I guess super separation between the, the properties uh, and, and, and really talking in terms of traversing so to go from property to property here you actually have to come out the property and walk along the roads here whereas like the properties on the beach you can either walk on the beach and go from property to property or the road if you will and if you're across the street from the beach then we have the shared user path depending on where the uh where the property don't want to uh get these cows yeah there's also a lot of cows here and goats usually when i when i ride in the morning not a lot but you know they're around but somebody was asking me, like, I went on a ride recently. They were like, man, you went on a ride by yourself? I was like, yeah, yeah. Um, and it was, they were, like, more so saying it in terms of concerns for safety. And I don't know. I don't, I don't feel, I've never, I don't ride in fear, like, when I'm on my bike. And so definitely not in my own town uh, at all. And I never even thought of like, like safety concerns. The only safety concerns is just like being on a bike, I would say, and not getting hit by a car or bus or a truck. And so just being aware of my surroundings and not taking any, any crazy risks. So yeah, never, never feared, ride in fear. And then same thing when I run, I've gotten that before. It's like, why are you running this neighborhood or that neighborhood? And I was like, I don't, you know, I don't run in, I don't run in fear either. And not just in Jamaica, I just kind of anywhere. Even in New York, my mom is like, oh, you know, you need to take your ID and your phone uh, when you're running in New York or in Brooklyn, anything can happen kind of thing, uh, which is true. And I understand people's concerns, but you know, in particular, like I'm not, if somebody's gonna like rob me, if that's the fear, like I don't have anything on me. Like I don't have my phone, I don't have my wallet, I don't have any money. Uh, so I don't really have anything to offer of value. And I don't know, at least that's that's my thinking. And I hate running, I hate running with stuff. I hate running with, um, I just want to be as light as humanly possible. And so if I can leave my phone at home, and be able to run freely, then I'm all for it. 
although that I, I have gone to new places, new cities, and gotten lost without my phone, which can be a little scary. That happened to me in South Africa. Uh, and I had to ask somebody, I was in Johannesburg and like just got lost in the city blocks and I had to ask somebody how to get back to the hotel I was staying at. And yeah, nice person, nice lady. She's out for her run. And she just told me how to get back to the hotel and I was fine. So yeah, no, no problem so far in terms of running. Okay, so this is Good Hope. I know that for sure. <laughs> uh, this is a community in, in the grill. A lot of our team members are travelers uh, live in the Good Hope area. And this is their football field on the right. I went, I remember like I was driving through here one time and like there was a big, big match here. I think it was high, two high school teams and it was at night and they had lights and everything, which was pretty cool. And I, I rode by there recently and the field is kept immaculately well, like very, very nice, like nice and cut. And I'm sure they have to water it because it's, it's super, super green and lush. And as you'll see soon, this is gonna take, a, this road that we're on right now, this is gonna take us all the way to Nampro Road. All right, sorry to cut that short break is complete we are ready to get back to the stream and what we came to talk about <laughs> which was actually why so many people are wanting to move to jamaica and this is coming off of the um interview that i did with israel uh which was right before this live stream and for if you didn't see it, I would definitely encourage you to take a look. Let me see if I can share the link. Oops. On the stream here. So this is the link to the interview that I did with Israel. And so he is going to bring a little context here for everybody. So we're all on the same page. He is Canadian born and raised. Has, you know, his parents aren't Jamaican or anything like that. But he visited Jamaica and essentially fell in love with it. And he is uh, a freedom fighter activist in Canada. And in our discussion, I opened up with this earlier, I learned so much about just Canadian history, Canadian racial history. And I had no idea, like you think about Canada, at least for me, like when I think about Canada, I think about this like extremely peaceful, welcoming, integrated, culturally diverse nation. And he explained to me, it's like, no, basically we're just really good at hiding our racism. I was like, man, that's so crazy. And he started going into the black history and the systemic racism uh, that exists in Canada. Whereas in, in the US, we have like overtly open racism here, uh, unfortunately. And yeah, it's it, it was just like a, an education for me. And so anyway, Israel found Jamaica, fell in love with Jamaica and he actually bought land in Westmoreland uh, that he and his partners are now farming and building uh, 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 housing there. He had mentioned he took a permaculture co course as well to, I guess, prepare himself for this new phase or new journey of life that he's about to begin or has already started, actually. And... The thing that I like, and then how me and Israel met, he did, he is in charge of this group called Black Black Exodus Living Local in Jamaica. And this is a Facebook group. And how we met is he did a retreat at Travelers. And I believe Misty Memphis is the one who uh, made me aware of him and his group. 
and we connected and just like just it was just like a natural vibe like i just like my, my my spirit just took to him kind of thing and we just started talking and i believe yeah yeah he hopped on a live stream that i was doing that day and then um he came on the pod and it was just like it's been amazing and this is like i really appreciate his mindset and one of the things one of the pillars of his group is basically living like like a local you know and how it's like his his mindset is like how can he contribute first as opposed to coming here and taking in and getting like what can he take back like no he's just he's, he's not about that at all and so anyway with his story to me he just made it seem possible i hopefully people who see see his story and watch it hopefully the way it's it comes across is just kind of show you what's possible for somebody who has no affiliation whatsoever to jamaica and to make it a reality and he bought land here that he's farming and he's building a home on off of the land kind of thing and he's going to do farming in jamaica and he's doing I believe the term he used was was forest farming and basically it's like how there is a way of planting the different fruits and trees around the property to help each plant fruit help grow one another i'm not too familiar to be honest and i think that's awesome and he is very much he brings his activism to jamaica and he doesn't even know i probably doesn't know this but like Shortly after, like we did the interview, uh, there was a there's another Facebook group that, you know, had a lot. There was a, I, I I don't want to say the comments, but there's a comment made on this group, and the thread of it just kept going and going. Had a lot of racial undertones, and uh, he came to the defense of one another i would say an active online person uh and he just really laid into laid into the group and just re really just was ready for all the smoke in that facebook group and i'm like man this is what we need i thought this is what we need and i'm like man he's already having an impact uh, the, albeit online, but now he is a property owner in Jamaica. He has a vested interest in the direction that Jamaica moves, the direction that Negro moves. And again, he's maintaining the mindset of the needs of the Jamaican people come first, and he's going to ensure that within it, under his guise and under his power. And I think that's really awesome and really powerful. And his story of like why he's moving to Jamaica. And I saved a few comments here. Um, this is from 80s hair. She says, uh, happy spiritual Sunday from Canada. A wonderful interview. I think Israel nailed it. Being black in Canada is not a picnic. And there's m several people, many people I've interviewed on my podcast where C Canadian and American mostly trying to think of any any uk people none none come to mind but canadian american that i can think of right now where this is a motivating one of the main motivating factors of moving to jamaica and moving to a black country is due to the experience of oppression racial oppression that they've gone through their entire lives or most of their lives in their home countries and both the people who I'm thinking of that I've interviewed, they both do not have any Jamaican affiliation whatsoever. Their parents are not Jamaican. Their grandparents are not Jamaican, but they fell in love and found Jamaica. And when they come to Jamaica, these are their words, not mine. They feel a weight has been lifted off of their shoulders and off of their chest. And they no longer have this weight of oppression that they feel and their home countries in which they were born. And Jamaica gives them that relief. And Jamaica gives them that freedom. And this is something that I highly respect and highly respect. And perhaps Jamaicans in particular who are living here and who 
maybe have never left Jamaica, uh, maybe have only left for a limited time. It's hard to appreciate and hard to understand that of being judged based on your, your, your skin color or having to do things certain ways that doesn't allow you to feel and be your, your true and authentic self. And so Jamaica gives that to a lot of people, a lot of people. And I don't think we, at least I don't think across the board, like we fully appreciate that sense of freedom that we give to people that the island gives to people. And it is a magical thing, you know, and it is something that is, can be hard to explain until you experience. And I'm thinking, particularly like perhaps black Americans, because I'm a black American and to go from living your life one way and to experiencing it a whole nother way by moving to another country. And I didn't really, I, and I, another example of this, I was at the, that same YouTube conference. I was in Texas. I've never been to Texas in my entire life. That's my first time going to Texas. I was in Dallas. <laughs> And I was talking to me and Candice were talking to the front desk lady at the hotel that we were staying at. And she, I think her parents were, I'm not sure if her parents were Jamaican, but she's been to Jamaica before. She stayed a couple swept away, absolutely fell in love with it. And she was already thinking about how can I retire and move to Jamaica? And I was like, hey, what do you know? I have a, a YouTube channel dedicated to that. And that's how we became we became connected. And she started, she gave us breakfast, free breakfast every single morning. Like me and Candy, so nice. Like we didn't expect that, but it was just so nice of her. Anyway, but she was just telling me just how racist Texas is, like Dallas is. I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, uh, she's like, it is in your face. They will tell you that you are not allowed in here because you're black that you're not allowed to, you will not qualify for this loan because you're black. I was like, there's no way. Like, I did not believe her. I know part of me, do, like, still doesn't believe her. I'm like, this is, there's no way what you're telling me is the reality. And she's like, I promise you, it's, it's like, that's just the way it is. Um, But I was like, there's so many black people down here. How can they accept it? And they, she was just like, yeah, they just accept, like, that's just the way it is. I'm like, that is crazy. And so. I'm taking this lady's experience who's working at the front desk at a hotel in Texas. And she's telling me like, this is the way that it has been. And she's from Atlanta originally. So she, basically from her experience of moving and living in Texas, like that's just the way it's been. And then to go to a place where that feeling, that oversight, that, that ceiling, that it just doesn't exist. Powerful, powerful, powerful stuff. And I know somebody earlier, uh, yeah, here we got it. Like Douglas was talking about why people want to move to Jamaica. And yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's the people, it's the weather, the culture, the food, the water. Absolutely all these intrinsic things that I think sometimes we do take for granted. And I think these things are wonderful and plays a lot into this. But you're also going on like the opposite end of the spectrum when you think about uh what the experience of certain people are going through and i and i've said this before the american experience the black american experience isn't equal the black american experience is going to be very different from a new yorker myself and then a southerner living in dallas texas and the same for if you're living in alabama as opposed to palo alto california so the black experience in america is not equal at all, at all. It really is subject to where you live in, what neighborhood you grew up in, who your neighbors are, what your community is like. Uh, but there are many parts of America that are very much like the way the young lady at the front desk of the hotel I was staying at in Dallas has described. And because I, I believe because so many people have lived that their entire lives like that and perhaps they just didn't know any better and then they go to a country come a country like jamaica where it's just like love is number one like there we there's no race people don't see race and everybody there's a togetherness that is and you know we may talk about the challenges that jamaica faces with violence but at the same time 
we're not a country that's just like because you're black you're going to be judged this way or that way like it just doesn't exist and my eyes started to open to this when i first first started the youtube channel i met a subscriber young lady young lawyer as a matter of fact black that was in dc and she was trying to move to jamaica and figuring out her first steps and doing so she's trying to figure out where she wanted to move to and she was telling me her reasons as to why she wanted to do this and it came down to like she was tired of like putting on this like fakeness like and she couldn't basically be her black authentic self and she was only there was only one other uh black lawyer in her law firm and you know they they basically could relate to this just this feeling of being unable to be their authentic self especially in a work environment and it's just like constantly being like that every single day that you go to work and i was like man uh that's that's crazy and she said she grew up in jamaica so she was here i don't know what age she left but she was telling me she didn't know she didn't know what racism was when she's growing up because everybody and then she also and she's like also explaining the difference in mentality between uh being jamaican being black and jamaican and then being black and american uh where there wasn't any limitation set for her in her mind in terms of what she could do and who she could become because everybody around her that was in a position of authority was black and i also thought that was powerful and i was like hey i never really thought about that and what i mean by that is like all her teachers were black her principal was black the bankers were black the managers the business owners that surrounded her life were black and so you saw all these people that were successful and doing well that you looked up to that were mentors that were professionals they were all black and like in her mind is just like because of that she was just like okay i can do all these great things and whereas she came to america i'm I, i'm not sure which part she came to first it was very different and it's like all the people that she saw who had authority and who had power um they were all white and it's just like in you know very different mentality but it didn't change her perspective on who she was and who she could become and so for these reasons um she was like uh, i need to get out of there i need to need to move to jamaica and just for my own mental mental well-being so israel is is doing the same thing and i think he's doing it in a very excuse me a very large large way and i think there are a lot of people who fall into that into that boat and there is a there's a growing black expat community in the grill i think in jamaica in general but i think in the grill and they a lot of this again is i think being motivated by the experience that they, that these individuals uh, and, and the individuals in these groups have gone through and they no longer and they realize and this is what as you were saying it's just like we don't have to be here we don't have to be here. Uh, and let me, I'm just going to play, hopefully it plays. I'm just going to play the the opening of the, uh, the podcast. One second. It's got a little, we have a uh, advertisement here. So I'm just going to play the opening and... You don't have to uh, watch the whole thing. Let me know if you could hear this. I'm just going to share my screen here. Thank you. 
Yeah, and that's that's pretty much the point I was I was trying to make uh, is that his realization and I think the realization of others is they no longer they don't have to be there. You know, they don't have to be take that and to be in a situation. Oh, there's no sound. Sorry. Let me uh, try to fix that real quick. It's less than a minute. One second. Sorry. All right, one second. All right, we'll do it again. They could just provide a beautiful experience for me that just makes me fall in love for like 14 weeks, almost every meal and every juice was from this garden. And I was just like, this is what's possible. Why do I not know about this? Why have I not experienced this? You see a lot of people who are frustrated with the racial situation in whatever country. It's just like, we don't have to be here. A lot of people want to fight for equality and try to make situations better in those countries for everyone, and I applaud them. I just got to a point where it's like, that can't be my mission, where I'm constantly trying to convince people to accept me when I don't have to be here. Yeah, so I guess that, that was the kind of the point I was trying to make, uh, that folks are realizing like they don't have to be in his case in canada they don't have to be uh, going through whatever whatever experience they are experiencing and they could essentially vote with their feet and vote with their dollars and not put up with systematic racism really you know especially if you feel as if you're just stifled by these by by the systems that are there and so like yeah i got my point is like people are coming to jamaica and moving to jamaica for different reasons and uh, this is one that early on very very early on i understood that this was a big reason that people were moving to jamaica and considering it there considering it to be their new future home and there are many other, you know, like, like I said before, there's so many other great reasons, but like, it's, it's that, but then it is all these other reasons, right? These other positives that are in Jamaica. And in the interview, I talked about the trajectory that Jamaica is on right now, the foreign direct investment that is coming, um, the different, I would say the different infrastructural plans that are being currently being uh, implemented. And I, I look at Jamaica, Jamaica is not a country that is moving backwards. I, I don't, it's, I'd be, and if you feel that way, you know, please let me know. Like, and I'm not one who's to think that like Jamaica is, is rainbows, unicorns, and butterflies. That's not by any means, but I do feel Jamaica is moving forward. And if you do feel like Jamaica is moving backwards, uh, as a whole, I mean, I'd love to hear about it. I'd love to hear about it. And I know some people have a little bit more pessimistic outlook on Jamaica, but generally and holistically, is Jamaica really moving backwards? I don't believe so. And talking with people like Israel, uh, it to me, it just makes me appreciate Jamaica so much more because he's a true outsider. He's a person that who really doesn't or hasn't had any direct affiliation with Jamaica, but sees the beauty in it in so many different ways and sees it as an extremely special, unique place on this globe. And he wants to be a part of it. Let's get to the comments real quick. we got a bunch coming in and I don't want to ignore you all. <laughs> Joe says, I went to school in Buffalo, New York, and I would travel to Toronto all the time, hang out, and it's just like NYC, in my opinion, but I guess you don't really know what it's really like as a visitor. You need to live there to experience the real deal. Same. I've been to Canada many times. I used to go to Canada a lot. Uh, I used to go, uh, before the pandemic, I was going at least once a year. 
I've always had a wonderful time. I've never had uh, a situation. I've never had like a any type of situation. I've had nothing but great things to say about Canada, about Toronto. Uh, but like you said, Joe, it's different. Visiting and living there is very different. Blooming Rose says, hi, all being black, African Caribbean is not a picnic in the UK either. Um, M-Q says, Jamaica is very welcoming to all. We see no racism. We love and welcome each and every one. Blooming Rose says, but we do still have an element of colorism in Jamaica. The colonialist legacy, shameful. I agree with that. That is sure. <laughs> Kemi Apple says, I live in San Antonio, Texas, and in my day-to-day -day interactions, people are nice here, mostly Hispanics here, but people greet one another. I'm sad to hear that young lady has that experience, has experienced that. Maru says, Caribbean is very colonial. The hands of power are in non-Black hands. You're not the first person to say that. Uh, recently, actually, I've heard somebody else said that. Uh, M dash cube says, but to be honest, it's more classism in Jamaica than it is more, uh, that is more eminent and prominent. Agreed. 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 Maru says, uh, the people will have to build up Jamaica because the government is not for Jamaicans and does not encourage cooperation with the diaspora. I don't know about that. I think there is, I think it can do a better job. You know, I don't think the government is against doing business or incentivizing the diaspora, I think we they can definitely do a better job for sure. M. Noel says, one of your viewers hit it on the nail. I would rather take the horrible customer service in Jamaica than the systemic racism in America and the UK. For sure. And this is, uh, this goes back. I did a interview with, um, oh man, I forget her last name, with Jessica. She has a YouTube channel. Uh man, I can't believe that Jessica's gonna kill me if she sees this. Uh, let me see if I could get her YouTube channel. Jessica Cargill. <laughs> Blank that out. We've been going for two hours strong here. So Jessica has a YouTube channel called Jessica Cargill. And we did an interview a few months ago. And one of the things I remember, one of the things she, she, so she moved, uh, she's Jamaican descendant. Uh, I believe her, either her mom or both her parents are Jamaican, but she was born and raised in Switzerland. And she moved from Switzerland to Jamaica a few years ago, I think eight at this point, maybe 10 years ago. And one of the things we talked about was the difference between Switzerland and Jamaica. And I mean, Switzerland. Switzerland is Switzerland, right? You hear all these amazing things about Switzerland. Um, I've never been to Switzerland, but you hear about the beauty. You hear about the economic prominence. I mean, for goodness sake, people go there to move money, you know, and to store money there. And she decided that moving to and living in Jamaica is a better life for her. And one of the things and statements he said in our sit down was you have to choose your struggle. And I thought that that is extremely powerful and very relevant to making a decision to move anywhere in the world from one place to another, because there's always going to be positives and negatives with anything you do and anywhere you're going to be in the world and choosing your struggle and choosing your red lines and choosing your points of acceptability in different elements of your life and lifestyle that you want to live. I think it's important to be very, very clear on that. And yes, moving to Jamaica, will you be giving up some of the quote unquote first world amenities that you may have grown accustomed to? Absolutely. But what do you get in return? And is what you get in return, does it outweigh the negatives of where you are and where you're coming from. And I think it really comes down to you making the choice of what is important to you and to your family and the well-being of your family and the kind of life that you want to live. And these are the things that 
I believe you will have to wrestle with when you are ultimately deciding, is Jamaica for me? Is this the best place for myself and my family and where I want to live and where I want to invest? And nowhere is perfect. Nowhere is perfect by any means. But again, as M. Knowles is saying and is referring to, is what would you rather have? And maybe some people, Black American, maybe you're living in a neighborhood or in a situation where you never experienced racism. And these things are just completely foreign to you. And you maybe you're saying, like, why would I move to Jamaica? Blah, blah, blah. Whatever. But at the end of the day, like, these are the type of conversations and these type of questions that it's, I believe, is important to ask yourself and to go through these exercises of thought uh, because you don't want to come down and be surprised. And I, and I see this a lot with being in the hotel industry of like people who've never left America, maybe coming to Jamaica just on their first vacation. It's like, they think everything is going to be like America. Well, in America, we do it this way. Well, in America, it's like this. Oh, they say in America, this is Jamaica. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying that this is the the like the mentality I, I believe a lot of america and it's an arrogance like honestly it really is an arrogance it's american arrogance and this is across like like just right across the board of just and i had this too you know i am a person i will be the first person to admit like i was very when i first moved to jamaica i had that same mental arrogance like uh like we in america we do it this way and this is the because it's america it's the better way and it's the way to do things. And that's a very, very poor mentality that to go into any culture or especially moving to and living there and doing business there. It's a, it's a poor mentality and you have to be malleable and you have to be willing to adjust and you have to realize that there's a way of doing things. And could you, is there a way of being more efficient? Yes, but it, it it can't be with a big stick. Like I learned this from being uh, running the hotel, running travelers. Is this like you have to ease into things? You you know, change has to be eased into. It's not something that's going to hang happen overnight, and it's something that you just have to work on slowly. And especially like you know, it's, it's my little business, my little family business, and the changes that I, that I was looking to make, and me and my brothers were looking to make. Like it's. Some of it is very embedded in the culture, but doesn't mean that it can't change. It doesn't mean that adjustments can't be made, but it may take some time. So anyway, my point in all and in, in all this is that you got to choose your struggle, like Jessica says. Got to got to choose your struggle. Like, what's important to you? You know, do you? Is it important that you have? You know that gluten free DiGiorno pizza from Whole Foods at your local supermarket in downtown Negril, which you're probably not going to get? Or would you have rather have like a much, I wouldn't say stress-free, but your stress levels are much lower in Jamaica uh, and just living instead of like, say, example, living in New York and living this hustle and bustle lifestyle and having this constant what would I say? Pressure, economic pressure that's weighing over your head on a day to day basis. And I'm not saying everybody in New York has this, but in a big way, it's 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 what is driving life in New York in, in many ways is, is money. So it's like these things that you I would say you have to think about and you have to weigh and what kind of lifestyle do you do you really want to live and what is important to you? All right, let's keep rolling here. Corey MPA says, did the lawyer move to Jamaica in the end? Uh, which lawyer are you talking about? Oh, they're talking about the one from DC. Yes, she did. So she, so she was thinking about like moving to Negril, Montego Bay, and Kingston. And she ultimately decided, and I told her, and I tell everybody this, like when you're trying to move to Jamaica, whether you're you know, if you haven't spent any significant time there or you haven't been back to Jamaica in a long time, if you can, if it's possible, like try to, and you're trying to decide where in Jamaica you want to live. If you can stay in Jamaica for an extended period of time and visit different areas of Jamaica, 
for like five days here, a week there, like get a feel of the community, get a feel of what it would possibly be like to live there and go around, if you can, if you can, and go around and figure out what best suits you because, you know, having grown up in Jamaica, however many years ago, and then moving back, it's a different Jamaica. It's a very, very different Jamaica. And I think it's important to do yourself a service of just easing that transition process. It's And it, and it is going to be a process and it is going to be a transition because I went through it. It took me over a year to fully acclimatize myself to Jamaica. And I had a really, really rough first year because I didn't mentally prepare myself to I mean, I kind of looking back, how could I? But like, I just didn't mentally prepare myself about what I was about to put myself through. And, you know, maybe ignorance is bliss. And maybe if I had known, maybe I wouldn't have done it. But it was a really tough transition for me. And my advice is like, ease that process for yourself, you know, know what you could possibly get yourself into. And the second thing too, is like, don't, Unless you know already and you're like, hey, the grill is it for me. I, this is where I feel most at home, most comfortable. I'm going to buy a house in the grill. But if you're somebody who's on the fence and you're not sure, and maybe you have a job that you can work, work remotely and it doesn't matter which part of the island that you live, you can you have a stream of income. Don't feel like, oh, if I move to Montego Bay, that's it. No, you can move to Montego Bay for a few months try it out and like, okay, I want to go try Port Antonio, go there. You still have your internet connection. You still have your job. You're making your income and then trying to grill afterwards. So don't feel as if you're like, once you move somewhere that you're renting, like that's it, decision made and you're just tied there. And so anyway, long story short, the young lady ended up moving to uh, Kingston because she thought it was going to be more the closest alignment to what she was used to being in uh, the DC area and it being a little bit more city like, because Kingston is very different from the grill, especially when it comes to like the social aspects of life. There's just more, and especially if like you're a young person, there's like more things to do clubs, parties, lounges. Uh, there's many more restaurants and different cuisines. It's an urban environment. So there is, by nature, there's just going to be more places that you can go to and more different places that you can patronize. So she decided to move to uh, to Kingston in the end, at the end of the day. Uh, Betsy says, glad to hear that because Jamaica makes me feel free and unburdened as well. Many reasons. One love, Yvette. Chinsey says... I had a similar experience moving to Canada, not feeling limited. I told myself if I ever had a child, I would move back to Jamaica to raise it. I didn't want my child growing up feeling inferior. Yeah, powerful, powerful, powerful stuff. Shirti, I see that situation affects Black Americans a lot. The biggest issue is that they don't grow up seeing the leader of the country, judges, et cetera, being black. And for a lot of them, wearing a business suit or dressing a, a certain way is uh, being an Uncle Tom growing up. Yeah, good point. Jan says, what makes Jamaica unique is that it is a malign of deeply intertwined and intermingled cultures and ethnicities more so than other multicultural nations jenny says i agree i'm no so you guys are having a conversation blooming rose says a jamaican acquaintance of mine says that she would think twice about going back as europeans who migrate to jamaica with no connection still get preferential such de deferential treatment than us i mean that's hard to say. I mean, there is like, I wouldn't say that. I, I, it's, there's nothing. I will say, like, in Jamaica, I don't think anybody has any advantage over me whatsoever. I just don't. I just don't feel that. And I don't feel anybody coming in here to, to move, to live, to work. I don't feel that they have any 
advantage or or anything like that over me at all. Uh, I don't feel limited in my goals. I don't feel limited in what I want to do and what I want to accomplish. I feel empowered more than anything else. And I, I think, and I really do believe that that's the reality. Just says, I realize there are multiple expats experiences in Jamaica. Some are living in expat silos and kind of just uh, live in Jamaica, but are not living the Jamaican experience. Then there are those that embed themselves in Jamaican culture and assimilate, have mixed feelings about expat silo people. Yep. I know exactly what you mean. Like, and as you're saying that, like, I know specific people who are like that. And I mean, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Right. Um, well, I know, I know exactly what you mean, Joe. And uh, there, again, there are like specific people that come to mind who are just like that. M-Dash Cube says, Jamaica is moving forward. Like, I believe that as well. Cersei Smith says, uh, I don't think it is moving backwards, but it is moving in a much in lockstep with the powers uh, that be like NATO and not fearlessly charting its own destiny. Kemi says, Jamaica is absolutely wonderful. The healthcare system, especially trauma care instances, instances uh, are frightening. The ambulance broke down with my mother-in-law. She's no longer here with us in the world. Yeah, definitely. We need we need help with this for sure. With oh, I would say trauma care specifically is is where I would like to see like just an exponential improvement in Jamaica. Like I would love to see that. And I think it's just so important. Like we need to continue to focus on that in a big, big way. Um, for Eva, so Jamaica definitely has racism. All humans are tribal creatures. Yeah. I mean, I've seen racism in Jamaica. I'm not going to lie, but like, not like systemic in your face. Police will kill you for being black racism. You know, there are, there's a spectrum, you know, and I think there are individuals who, who are outliers in Jamaica for sure. Um, but is that a defining element of our culture? I don't think by any means, any significant means. Jay Fitz, uh, horrible customer service versus racism in America. Why are we willing to accept either? Both unacceptable. Good point. Good point. But I believe one we will be able to fix in our lifetime and the other, I don't know. Jamaican uh, 1979 says Jamaican economic growth should benefit grassroots Jamaicans first. Agreed. Nicholas Reed, what's going on? Thanks for chiming in. Copeland Russell says, I just hear the PM plans for Jamaica. He is doing a great job. Thank God. Great things are coming to Jamaica. Ruth says, what is first world? Is GMO poison food first world? You know, one day we're going to get into, like next year, we're definitely going to get more into health and nutrition in a big way on this channel. I promise. Like, it's just something that I've been into like this last, last few years, but more so this year than anything else. And I think it's something that needs to be part of our, our, our conversation, uh, our conversations, our culture, our lifestyles. Like, I mean, this is definitely going to be a big part of this channel, like hundred percent. Thank you for the opportunity to, for me to talk about that. That's another thing we're going to be talking about in a big, big, big way. And this is something like, I feel like all channels that are, you know, I don't, I, I mean, if you're a pro Jamaica channel, even if you're like, you know, talking about like the stock market in Jamaica or real estate, man, I think we all should be uh, like, if we have a platform, we should be talking about these things because it's a priority. I think, I think a lot of it is just like, it's, it's crazy where we're going to. And when we look at the health profile of Jamaicans of black people, like there's so many things that we're doing to ourselves, but it's also, there's so many things that we are system that we are fighting against, you know, the marketing, the big farmer, the big food, like it's, it's just something that we need to continue, 
excuse me, continuously talk about. And I think there are a lot of elements of Jamaica and its natural resources, particularly with food, that is another huge advantage of moving to Jamaica. And we talk about living a healthy lifestyle, uh, both mentally and physically. I think a lot of it has to do with what we put into our bodies. So I guess we're we're doing a little foreshadowing here, but we will be talking about it in a big, big way. And a lot of content next year will be dedicated to that. Yvette says, uh, these are the people I don't want to be in Jamaica. What's the point of moving to a place and try to change it? Justin D says, ask uh, Mobe hotel workers how they feel about Americans who come to Jamaica for the first time with their ignorance and nothing positive. Yeah. It's sad. It's sad. Uh, um, I am um, again. I see, I see. I see it. But hopefully, you know. Uh, but I've also seen turnarounds. You know, I've seen Americans come to Jamaica and they fall like even with it, their ignorance and being the first time they come there. But they do end up falling in love with Jamaica and they and, and Jamaica changes their mindset and they develop these relationships with locals and it keeps them coming back like year after year and they become family and it's a beautiful thing to see the progression of mindset over over years so it's it's possible Bernard Dew says people are blinded by colonial slavery to racism and the miseducation of black history makes people fearful of change Andrew Max says Americans are arrogant af they go to another country and expect an American experience yeah I see that over and over again Joe says it's it is straight American arrogance, and I admit that I have the ment that mentality when I go to other places. Not proud of it, but it's true. Like I said, I'm guilty of it, and I have been guilty of it in the past. Yvette says, uh, when you change it, it will no longer be the place you want to go. M Dash says, I'm from the diaspora, and that uh, mentality is a natural tendency. But if you think objectively and what is value of, of both places, and put it in the balance there, and then you'll see the real value. Corey MPA says, I want to change Jamaica. It needs serious change. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I do believe there's a lot of things that, that need to change in Jamaica. But I think the essence of the people and the culture, I don't think that needs to change. You know, we talked about having a more efficient banking system and a banking experience. That needs to change. The roads being done on a regular basis and having smooth inter in uh highways and even pathways of down lanes and neighborhoods we need that needs to change we need to have modern housing for the average jamaican that needs to change um i think tariff duties on the country that needs to come down that needs to change i think there needs to be a higher and more incentives for the diaspora to move back that needs to change i think there needs to be more incentive for entrepreneurial ventures and experimentation i think that needs to change i think the education system needs to change and needs to be completely reformed in order for us to compete globally with other nations around the world i think that needs to change i i mean oh, i think that is the pr progress of the country and uh, hopefully nobody has any argument with that and those changes that needs to happen. Um, I think the timeline in which change happens need to happen faster. I think that needs to change. But as far as like the culture and who we are as a people, no, I don't think that needs to change. And I and I and an example of that is when I went to um, when I went to uh, Mexico and Tulum. I experienced very, very, very little Mexican culture when I was there. Very little. Uh, because it was very, that Tulum community was very 100% geared towards North American culture. From the music to the cuisine. Yeah, there was Mexican cuisine for sure. But the cuisine uh, very much was super Americanized, like all of the American stores were there, the Starbucks, the this, the that, like you name it, you got it. Um, so, uh, you know, do I want to see Jamaica change in that way? No, I still want Jamaica to be Jamaica, you know, and I think Jamaica has a very, very strong culture that it would be hard for me to see it move that far on that side of the spectrum. 
But is it possible? Yeah, but something that we I think we need to be careful of and be mindful of. M Dash says, I can honestly say Jamaica is the best place on earth, bar none. All right, I like that. Justin says, America, the least racist country, quite a bubble you exist in. <laughs> Who said that? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's that's crazy. <laughs> um, Copeland Russell says, how could you get the young men to go and get these jobs that is now available in the country right now, in Mabe right now, in construction, they can't find workers. Yeah, we do have a, we have a labor shortage that we're going through in, in Jamaica. It is a, especially in construction, it is, it has become challenging, even in hotels, hotels, uh, I can speak for travelers, um, and other hotels in the growth community having a really tough time finding, finding workers. Camille says, I would live in Jamaica and work remotely, but afraid the internet is not stable. Is anyone using Starlink? I would say the internet is pretty stable in Jamaica. There are many people who work remotely, tons of people who work remotely in Jamaica. I mean, my my business is 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 built on the internet in a sense. Uh, we have guests that travelers who come and to Jamaica stay here months at a time at travelers and work remotely. So I'm not sure what you do for work, uh, Camille. But I mean, it is it is possible, and I, I would say the the internet connection is I would say good to great, at least in the grill. AP says, I wonder in the paradigm shift that. If the paradigm shift that needs to happen is similar to what Norway and Saudi Arabia did, create a wealth fund out of the oil sales that builds up a social safety net for the country. Yeah, but I think we need, yeah, like Norway has the largest sovereign wealth fund in the entire world by like miles, but we we don't have an industry. I mean, we don't, I was going to say Jamaica doesn't export anything, but we import more than we export. And so we don't have an industry that is really driving the economy and the GDP of Jamaica to a point where we can have just an excess amount of funds that would warrant us to have a healthy so uh, uh, sovereign wealth fund. We're just not at that point. Uh, King Naldo brought up earlier that there is a deal being worked with an, uh, and uh an oil that manufacturing an oil mining company so maybe that could be it i don't know but we don't have that right now uh, what is also on the horizon is becoming a global logistics hub perhaps that would put us in a position to do that but i i, I like your thinking ap i like where i like where your your head is at and where your mind is at <laughs> Blue Moreau says, my cousin is continuing telling me about the long lines outside the American embassy. That speaks volumes. JA cannot sustain this population, especially uh, young people. I mean, people are looking and always will be looking for opportunities abroad. But hopefully we are on the path to developing a country and developing opportunities within our country where people are like, man, why would I leave Jamaica? But I, I also believe that it's it's and I've said this many times on this podcast before, is that it's, it's, I think it's incredibly important for Jamaicans to get out of Jamaica and to get experience, to get work experience abroad, because it's that experience that hopefully, yes, some will stay and won't come back, but hopefully there will be a, a percentage of those individuals who get experience, work for American Fortune 500 companies are even working for McDonald's. As a matter of fact, you could learn so much from working for an American McDonald's, Jamaica doesn't have McDonald's, but but working for uh, a franchise or corporation like that and bringing that back to Jamaica. I mean, I still, my first job, I was working at, at, at DNC at Jones Beach when I was 14 years old. There was so many elements of that experience and of that job that I brought to travelers that I even still reflect on at this point. And it was just yeah, my teenage first job, but still, nonetheless, it was work experience. It was life experience. And I feel like that allowed me to bring uh, and 
something to <laughs> something to the table, you know. So I think it's important to travel. I think it's important to have these uh, these global experience, and it doesn't have to be America; it could be anywhere. I mean, travel is just one of those things, one of those educations that you just you just can't pay for. Emil says, "Agree, Jamaica is Jamaica because of the people and the culture. Just need to update our and our." or improve the infra infrastructures that you mentioned. Yvette says that Tulum experience is what I don't want happening in Jamaica. Same here. Donna Marie says, when would Jamaicans unite and start businesses? Are we the only way to work with others and not on your own? That is temporary throp. You are blessed to have a parent who emphasizes entrepreneurship. I agree. Very thankful for that. Yvette says, I remember doing going to a hotel in Jamaica and having to place an order for Aki and Sawfish because the menu was so American. Norma Davis says, good afternoon to everyone. Throp, do you know of a financial planner in Jamaica? Yeah, I got tons. Um, shoot me an email. Throp at thropmedia.com and I will put you in touch. Betsy Mason says, progress, but uh not too much change please uh jamaica culture is fine add to it do not subtract totally agree andrew max says a labor shortage in construction are you serious yep 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 the princess hotel sorry the princess hotel i don't know but it, it either shut down or slowed down significantly a few ye few months ago excuse me again as a reminder this is the largest hotel being built in jamaica two thousand rooms and because in the problem was they couldn't they had labor shortage and i know somebody mentioned about like why are we bringing in chinese labor or outside labor you can't find the workers you know what are we going to do we talk about the progress of the country and moving it forward and if we can't find in country the the the, the, the workers that we need what are these companies left to do and that's an open question that's not a rhetorical question and so I have no problem with that. You know, if we're doing a project, a large scale project, and we're trying to get local workers and we just can't, are we supposed to just like let the project stop? Or, you know, but it's, 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 and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not being necessarily cynical, but like it's a problem that needs to be solved for sure. But I think for the sake of the project or development or whatever it is, like it needs to move forward. Shane of coaching says, is a uh, large labor shortage or lack of training? Good point. Good point. Could be. Could be like we, like, I was going to say with the hotel, it's, it's, it's challenging. It's challenging. There's, we're just not getting, we got to think that we're a country of, I, I'm getting tired, so it's hard to do this math. But anyway, we're a country of 3 million people. And our labor pool is only a, a, a portion of that. And, you know, how much, depending on your industry, how much of that qualified labor pool, that labor pool is qualified for the job that you are looking to fulfill. So it's all these things that uh, these, these these laws and rules of large numbers that, you, that have to be taken into consideration. Andrew Max says, is it fair to say there's a labor shortage when you actually have the human resources available to train and educate? Well, I would say it's a labor shortage in the sense that you're looking to fill 100 jobs of people who have the competency of level two, let's say, and you just don't you don't have that. So like you said, like you and Shane are saying, yeah, it could be the training for sure. Maybe we don't have enough trainers um and we're not putting them through but at the end of the day you know i'm not trying to blame anybody or anything like that but if we just don't have the people to do the work that needs to be done the qualified people whatever it is at the end of the day we don't have we have a shortage of labor the out here a jamaican uh, jamaican's tourism industry will eventually become oversaturated there will be nothing but buildings and businesses taking up Jamaica and the beauty of the island will be gone. Uh, let's hope that doesn't happen. Uh, Justin says there's a pay shortage in the construction industry. They leave that part out. 
Um, could be. I don't really know about. I, I find construction to be extremely expensive uh, in Jamaica. So, but also the, I would say materials are also expensive. So that could be a big part of it. Betsy Mason says internet was fine in a grill. I found. Mm. Andrew Max says, sounds like a contradiction. Many Jamaicans waiting outside the U.S. Embassy to go to America to get jobs while the government is saying there's a labor shortage. I mean, the government is not saying there's a labor shortage. I mean, I think it's this indus these industries are saying that. Like, And I'm telling you, like from a hospitality perspective, it's like we don't have enough workers and like we're trying and like it's not just travelers like i'm talking to like all hotels like in the grill and it's just like everybody's just trying like and everybody's pulling from the same pool you know we're, we're trying to get the same people and trying to get this people to work from that from that this hotel and that hotel and they're just not enough uh and then am i even gonna get into the whole young people thing <laughs> Uh, so, and then with the construction, you know, the private sector princess hotel, like I said earlier, they didn't have a, they didn't have enough construction workers and they had to slow down slash close off construction of their hotel because of that. Everett Moore says, following up on the internet question, internet services, service in remote locations in Jamaica is very poor. I plan to get Starlink soon because it's the only reliable option in my it, in my area. Yep, I heard that before as well. Justin D says, can't learn about the world without traveling. Absolutely. Shana says, I think a res reverse brain drain can happen when retirees, returnees, or Jamaican descent decide to live in Jamaica. That can bring the skills, expertise, and our enterprise to make the incremental shift. I love that, Shana. What a gem. I'm screenshotting that. Uh, Joe says, that's why Grace Kennedy started the Jamaican Birthright Program. is an internship program offered to qualified applicants of Jamaican lineage. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Bloomberg, Blooming Rose, excuse me. Uh, why can't Jamaican governments be more loyal to their own black people? Why don't they insist as part of a development deal that the Chinese train adopt apprentices employ locals. Andrew Max says everybody in Jamaica is a builder. <laughs> All these houses being built, very nice houses, and they're being built by locals. I reject this narrative. There's a labor shortage, especially in construction. Jamaican diaspora discussion, the Jamaica diaspora discussion forum, excuse me. They are building the hotels in the wrong places. Hotels need to be built where there are labor shortages. Uh, correction, sorry, hotel needs to be built where there is high unemployment. Well, I could tell you a lot of the workers get pulled to Negril. Like I remember like uh, Royalton specifically when they were building that in Negril. Um, I mean, labor came from all over the island, all over the island. And one of the concerns was, is like where all these construction workers were living and staying, we didn't have the housing for them. So, yeah, that I won't get into that, but that turned into there were some nightmare situations with that. Let's just say. AP says, so what is a mix of industries Jamaica can have to make an economic change? Tourism, logistics, is that that's it? I will have to investigate this topic more. Investment in the country can't be sustained on tourism. I agree. I think we have a lot of potential and opportunity to diversify the different industries that are out there. Clive Thompson says, Throp. I'm of the mind to agree with the, in the previous comments. Jamaica is not investing in training the youth and the people in the technical and construction skills and services. Honestly, it's a no brainer. I agree. I think, I think there is, I think there's a lot to be, to be done in that area. It's kind of what I was saying, like education reform, like even like traditional education, but also from like a skills standpoint as well. Like it needs to be a lot more effort and a lot more thought needs to be put into that. 
I think so. I, I, I agree with you. And as I was talking about earlier, it's just like that pipeline. We just need to go further and further upstream because the labor force that we have today, the 21 year olds, the 18 year olds, you know, what did we do? What did we have in place for them as youngsters, as kids, as students that would give them the best opportunity to bring them into a society or bring them into the working world and into the workforce that would not only allow them to have the opportunity to live a prosperous, fulfilling life, but also to be an individual that contributes to the forward movement of society in the biggest of ways. These are the questions. I think these are the thought exercises that we need to start having on a more regular basis and think who is going to be the next 18 or 21 year old in 18 or 21 years from now. And it will be in that same position inevitably. And how can we learn from, I wouldn't say mistakes, but how can we improve the process of putting them into the labor force and putting them into the workforce? All right, we're going to start wrapping up. We've been going a while. We almost had three hours. Okay, okay. All right, last few comments here. And then I'm going to start to close off. Um, I'm sorry that I, I won't have get to everybody's comments here. Jay Fitz, with the labor shortage in Jamaican culture, if the person wanted to start a service business, would they have to bring workers from outside to ensure they provide quality customer service? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. And it's also, I think it depends on what type of business that you're in and also where you are on the life cycle of that business. Like, do you have the bandwidth patience to train that person? Uh, like, where is your business business at this point? Can you bring in, say, a, a young person that doesn't necessarily have any formal experience or formal training in whatever industry that you're doing? And do you have for six months to train that person to get to a point where they can have an, a positive impact on your business, that you could trust them to do the job that you're doing, that you need them to do, excuse me. So these are the type of questions. And like, this is what, th and this is what I think is playing into the labor shortage. Some companies don't have the time to train somebody for six months and and in, in, it, it takes a long time to get somebody and like, you know, even if the, of the quote unquote simplest of jobs you may think of, are like of like being a waiter, but having a waiter or waitress come into the job and not having any skills whatsoever, it takes them time. It takes them months, I would say, to be proficient in their job. If you have zero experience, you know, if they have zero experience, it's going to take months to train that person up. It just takes time. And any job, any job. I was, I visited Google the other day. My friend working there did a whole full tour of the, of the campus and everything like that. And he was telling me about uh, a person who is a part of their team. And this is high level programming, this and that. Top education, one of the top companies in the entire world. And he says he has somebody on his team that they've been in training for three months so far. And basically they have no, has had no effective impact on Google and the team and what they're doing. And this is not, a, but it's designed that way because Google understands it just takes a long time. He's like, they probably won't get until month six until like things really start rolling. And like, if you have a business and like you, you know, entrepreneur, like you understand this, like it takes time. Like, you know, that's why hiring somebody, especially if you're a small business, it's such a, like, it's such a serious, I can't uh, overestimate or uh, overemphasize how serious and impactful a decision is to decide on who is coming into your company and are they the right person? Are they going to have the right cultural fit? Do they have the right skill set? And that's Google. And he's telling me like, it's going to take six months. So, I mean, why would it be any different for anything, any other type of business that we're doing? So it takes time for like, like people coming into the fold to, to really get up and running and to like really get that company in that position moving and firing on all, pist on, on all pistons. Okay. Justin D says, companies don't want to invest in training because Loyalty is an issue and they don't want to spend money to train people for their competitors. 
I was gonna I was trying to avoid this, but <laughs> I guess we'll talk about it. So going back to the Google example, is just like if you have an engineer, so to speak, and he was my friend was explaining this to me, and you hire them and you go through this process and you're at month two or three or whatever, and you know we need to get them to that month six, and the you know the hiring agency manager or whatever quote unquote makes a mistake and it's the wrong person that they bring in that could be a multi-million dollar mistake that they made you know maybe they're paying that engineer half a million dollars a year and they started the trip like that could be um at least a million maybe a multi-million dollar error that they've made in the hiring and so we could take that and we could scale it down to the entrepreneurial ventures and the startup ventures that we may have in jamaica and so it's and like, and then we think about like you were saying, Justin, of like spreading this again. This is what I was alluding to, like with young people. You know, there's no there, the loyalty is not there. You know, and I would even venture to say that the power, perhaps, is now, uh, for better or for worse, is in the employee. You know, because they're because they, I mean, it's supply and demand. There are more job openings than there are job than there are job applicants, and so now you know this as an employee, as a somebody looking for a job, and eh, this was all I thought it was. Let me go try the Acme company down the road, and perhaps you've wasted three weeks or three months of training on this on this person. And I hate to put this on young people, but that's just been an experience that. I would say a lot of entrepreneurs have been facing here in the States too. My friend owns a UPS. Yeah. He owns a UPS store and he was just telling me, he's like, man, it's just like he had to start working shifts because he just can't find employees. Um, this was earlier this year. I'm not sure if he's still in the same boat, but he's just like, man, it's hard to get young people to work. It's hard to get young people to stay for any, any significant period of time. Like he's now, he's like, he'd rather hire just like, you know, a 30 year old with a young family and a baby, because this is like his job means so much more to him as opposed to like a young person who just, you know, doesn't doesn't have any like familiar responsibilities or anything like that and could hop from job to job. So it's a very interesting dynamic and a very interesting time that we find ourselves in in the uh, in the in the in the working world. Joe says, uh, can you interview somebody that has moved to Jamaica and started a brick and mortar medical service, like having uh, an American based private practice to having a Jamaican based private? Is it financially sustainable? Can one live an upper middle class life? I think this is a great question, Joe. I'm screenshotting this. Thank you for that. Andrew Max says, in every business, you have to train your workers, no matter how educated or experienced the new hires. Absolutely. Kemi says, these young employees aren't taking the abuse from employers like some of us did. I agree there's an element of that. But I also will say there's a there's a, there's a large element of that. But I will also say, and I was having this discussion with like Candice, um, I believe even Havrika, and I look at just even the progression of Throp, of Throp Media and the amount, I mean, we've only been 23, we've only been officially around for two years and the amount of employees that we've gone through is crazy. I mean, and it's, and it's all young people. It's all young. I mean, we're in the creative industry, we're in media, filmmaking, and now it's just like there are no longer any like there's nobody on my team that is below 30 years old and it's like the young people like i guess they understand like they just move from job to job and it's just like the the loyalty is just not there um haven't seen it like that's just been my personal experience and i i i don't abuse anybody i don't yell at anybody i don't curse at anybody um even you know i had mentioned this before uh, whether you're at, at ThropX, you probably probably didn't even notice, but like the the and I'm not like airing dirty laundry. This is like the this is just what happened. Like a couple of days, two days before ThropX, like the our main producer that was supposed to run the show, um, she decided to go take another opportunity that just came up, 
and just thought that was better for her career. And this was something that we had planned for like one of the main reasons she got hired seven months ago, like a young lady. And I was just like, wow, this is crazy to me. But, you know, that was her decision in doing so. And I didn't, I didn't yell. I didn't get upset. And I just told her, you know, this is her choice and that's what she wants to do. And I wished her the best. And I, you know, I wished, I wish she didn't make that decision and put us in this position at the last minute, but it's, it was surprising, but it was also wasn't surprising. But again, for a small startup company, media company, digital media company, like we've gone through like, I mean, over 10 employees. No, it can't be. It may be about maybe almost 10 employees. It's all young people. And it just like the churn is crazy. And I, I it doesn't, at least in my specific situation in my company, it didn't come down to like any abuse or being disrespected or anything like that. It was just there are other they're chasing and I and I, I'm going to 100% dedicate a podcast to this. But there is I'm speaking generally here. I'm not speaking specifically about anybody. Is that people are just going after like the next opportunity, what they perceive as the next opportunity, next best opportunity. And the long-term thinking is just not there. And it's just about that, that, that dollar. Now um, there is a huge lack of delayed gratification that I think is embedded, really embedded in the workforce, like right across the board. And oh, it's, um, uh, it's uh it's an unfortunate thing and it speaks volumes to where the like society from a workforce standpoint is right now and i think like you know where are we going to be where is the labor force going to be in 10 or 20 years from now if this is the the baseline mentality that uh the young people who are coming into the workforce are now Again, this has been purely my experience, and this is purely like what has happened to me. And I know other people and other industries have, have been experienced similar, similar things. All right, I'm going to start closing off here. Uh, last few comments. I know I've been saying this forever. <laughs> uh, Andrew Max says, most of us did the same thing in our 20s. I went through so many jobs in my 20s. I lost count as part of growing as a young adult, in my opinion. Fair enough. It could be. And I can, that's what I told the young lady. I was like, you know, in five years, you're going to be a little bit older, a little bit wiser. And you may look back on this experience with, with different eyes. Simone says the advancement of technology slash social media have given young people so many options that they just go to the next, next thing without building any foundation in anything. Their mindset is now believe that. Justin D says, so did we and the generation before us, Joe? OK, I'll let you guys talk. Ms. Cole says, as a millennial, I'm not holding an argument with, <laughs> with Gen Z. Uh, Samantha Morris is great discussion. Thank you. Jamaican Diaspora says, there are hundreds and thousands of mature adults around Jamaica with a family. They are in their 30s and 40s. They would love to work in a hotel where they can go home to a partner and children. Kuya Cudley says, the same thing is happening in the U.S. with people of the same age. Yeah, I don't think it's unique to Jamaica. I think this just happening right across the board anyway i think we're going to close it off right now we are exactly at the three hour mark did not mean to go this long but this was a nice discussion and i enjoyed hanging out with you on sunday and especially those who came in on the video premiere with the israel interview if you haven't watched it go ahead and give it a watch i'm going to throw it in the comment section there and if you haven't already hit that like button if you're not subscribed why not? Why aren't you subscribed? Hit that subscribe button. We'll be back again next Sunday. What we're going to talk about, I am unsure. But this was a fun one. Enjoyed hanging out with you for the last three hours, which was fun. And I will see you next Sunday. Everybody have a great, great week. Those of you in cold temperatures, try and stay warm. See you on Sunday. Peace, everyone.